this meeting to order. It's 6.30. Uh, my name is Joe McGivern. I chair the Holyoke City Council's Finance Committee. Members of the committee, uh, to my far right is Juan Anderson Burgos. Next to Juan is Peter Tallman. To my left is Kevin Jordan, followed by Will Powell. Uh, five members, uh, no hybrid this evening, so it'll be regular voting, some, uh, some roll call, but not necessarily because of, uh, of Zoom. Uh, we do have a number of guests online on Zoom, and they are always welcome. And we do have a number of guests in the audience. We are also joined by Councillor Bartley in the chambers. Uh, and at the moment, I think that's it. We have a very aggressive agenda. We are live televised. We are being streamed. We are Zoomed, which is our recording uh, element. And we will get through this with due diligence but we'll get through this as quickly as we possibly can because there's some very important uh, information, especially towards the uh, latter part of the uh, agenda itself. With that in mind, the chair will entertain item number one. Motion to take item one off the table. Motion may second to take item one off the table. All those in favor, Aye. any opposed? Aye. Item number one came to us. We actually uh, took it up back in uh, February uh, of last year. Item number one, there was no business address, and we, our administrative assistant has reached out to the uh, petitioner. Uh, we don't believe there is any need, or it doesn't appear that the uh, person is still interested. So I would just suggest that we uh, not vote on it because that could cause problems, but just returned it to the petitioner for uh, lack of uh, information being the, the business address itself. So moved. On that motion, return to the petitioner. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Item number two. Introduced uh, by myself on behalf of the mayor, there be by appropriation by transfer in fiscal year 2023, $250,000. $100,000 from dispatchers, one fifty dollars from patrolmen, totaling two fifty dollars into their overtime account. Motion to remove it from the table. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Uh, from the police department, we have Chief Pratt. Chief, welcome. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, the, uh, the request for transfer, can you explain just the reason there is surpluses in these line items? I think we know, but we want everybody in the public to hear and the reasons and where we are where we stand with overtime okay so um the uh we're going to be transferring it from the 91 dispatch which is our uh a reimbursable grant for uh to pay psap to pay for uh salaries and overtime and the other uh part of it the 100,000 from there and the 150 from patrol is just our uh surplus from our vacant positions and um, uh, grant positions that create the surplus there and backfill our, our, our uh, department personnel. The uh, current status, uh, the overtime account is, is roughly at about 80,000 right now. We've been averaging just under 40. So it gives us a couple uh, pay periods left um, to bring this you, which is kind of the uh, process we've been using uh, all last year and into this year is just for the event of uh, you know timing wise to get it so that we can get it to the committee and back to council and uh, I would imagine by the time we actually vote on it will be another pay period down so um, this should uh, get us much further into the year I can't say I won't be back Probably one more time, but hopefully uh, we'll see where we're at. Another Chief, the months. average the average per pay period is what? Forty. Forty. Thank you. Right now, thirty around thirty nine thousand, thirty nine six or something like that. Okay, and that's up about six seven thousand from the average last year. I think we were I averaging around. 38 last year we were we went through a period where we got it down into the lower 30s and that does traditionally happen um 
I think it was but, 38, uh, you know, through the summer season, through the vacation season, and then yeah. it seemed to get down for the rest of the year to about 34, 35. I, think I could did, be wrong. Yeah. This year, you know, we definitely had some other uh, challenges with uh, injured on duty, and I, I think we talked about it at the last meeting, and then um, or one of the last meetings we had. And also, um, we've had, a, you know, sort of a, I don't want to even call it a spike, but we've had some family medical leave as well that uh, is up. So um, those two things combined have created a little extra, but we are very shortly in uh, mid-March, we should get our six officers out of the academy, which will help bolster the uh, forces, which, you know, always traditionally helps us with overtime. And when the six come out of the academy, you'll be up to how many? Um, that six, with the retirements we have, will put us at about 80 three and we're hiring 11 for the april academy so we that will bring us to 94 or 90 yeah 94 total 92 plus the i should say 92 plus the two school resource officers which doesn't as you know come from our budget any discussion questions from the committee i have a few councilor Jordan. okay Chief, uh, good to see you again. I, I would just note uh, on the money coming from section on the dispatchers, uh, co colleagues may remember that I had pointed out that the E911 dispatcher line was overfunded and um, I had proposed a cut to this line. I just want to point that out that we're now removing $100,000 from this line uh, to now transfer it into overtime. Uh, second point I would like to make is, Chief, as we're getting to the release of the audit, um, is this overtime and why we spend a million dollars a year in overtime, is that being one of the questions examined in the audit? Oh, yes. Yep. Okay. So hopefully... Um, you know, they're at least analyzing and taking a look, and that'll give us some insights into this. Um, I also had recently sent you some questions um, that I had shared with also the council president relative to injured on duty and some of the impact that this has, because I think it's a, a large contributing factor, if I was listening carefully to you at prior meetings, to, the, to why the overtime is what the overtime is. Uh, are, are you, how are you progressing on getting some answers to those questions? Um, I'm, I'm looking into that. Just so you know, I, I kind of had to send it over to the law department too to just to see what exactly I could release or not release or, um, and, and kind of analyze that. I mm. should have a, um, something back from them shortly and then I'll see what I can do. I find it interesting, you know, it seems like there's a trend here that anytime I ask questions, immediately everybody runs to the law department. Um, I, I, I'm intrigued by that. It's like, I, I have a job to do here. I think I have the right to ask questions. And it's like, you know, first question anybody asks is, do, do I have to answer this guy's questions? Um, you know, just kind of interesting. Um, it's not just you, Chief. It seems to make it's it's all over the place. So hopefully uh, the law department will you know look into that pretty quickly uh, because you know obviously I I also have a job to do and I, and quite frankly if the law department has any issue with any questions I ask I, I've already asked them in the past to please see me directly um, you know because I obviously as you know I'm here on behalf of the taxpayers of Holyoke to make sure to the best of my ability every dollar is spent as it should be. So, um, okay, well, uh, thank you, appreciate that, and uh, I know you're thus far trying your best to keep this, you know, on, on target. So, uh, we'll follow up more later. Chief, on the record, I think when you talked in the law department, you are talking about HIPAA laws? Correct. Okay. Did, uh, Chief, did I at any time <clears throat> ask for any information about people's names? I'm asking um, for, I'm asking yeah, for- Yeah, I think you did, actually. You asked for names, rank, um, a couple other things that I just, I wasn't, you know, I just wanted to be sure before I give that kind of stuff out. 
I believe the question was names attributed to medical conditions. No, we wanted we have a right to have payroll records of who is actually receiving pay. I mean, that's public information. That isn't at issue. So, you know, well, hopefully this isn't going to turn into a month. To get an answer to, so I can give you your answer. That's yeah. All right, Councilor Powell. Councilor Powell. Mayor Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Good evening, counselors. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, I, just like you counselors, we're also here um, trying to be good stewards of taxpayer resources and representing um, the, the, the public and community. I don't think there was any intention from any department to make any counselor feel like we're withholding information. I think naturally, because it's personnel, we want the legal department to kind of filter to make sure we're not, because we're not experts in the area either, and that we're not doing anything that will later lead us to some sort of conflict. So it's not at all against what you're asking for, Counselor. The other thing too, and as you're aware, we are, we, you know, we've, we're in the process of procuring consultants to help us do a workplace safety audit. Right. And actually during the MMA conference, um, uh, Kelly met up with our friends over at the state that oversee workplace safety, and apparently they do that level of work on, for cities and towns at no cost, which was interesting, so we're exploring that. But certainly, like, I think the thought process here, and, and, and you know, if I'm wrong or please guide me, I, I, do, I do respect the direction that you guys offer and, and advice mm -hmm. to. The idea would be that if we bring an organization on board that's qualified to do that level of assessment, that we work within the scope of that work so that we're not doing more than what we need to or mm -hmm. potentially bring in a potential liability that could have been avoided. So I'm thinking the safest route for all of us um, would be to allow an organization qualified to do that level of assessment to help us adequately assess what our workplace safety concerns and, and the three really major areas, which is DPW, police and fire, right. where we're getting all of these, um, mostly in police and fire. Um, but it wasn't at all, Counselor, to make, you know, I, I think when we send things to legal, it's not because we're saying we don't want to right. ask too many questions. What's going on? It's just mainly to protect the city so we're not doing anything we're not supposed to. But we don't disagree with the direction you're trying to go, which is why right. we're having those conversations trying to bring that consultant in. Which is great. And obviously fixing the problem and the root causes. But just so we're all crystal clear what was asked, I asked to have who we get these requests. The problem is this goes on for months and months and months and we ask for these reports. So I was asked, please send to the chief the specific questions. The specific questions is who's out on leave? What's the positions? How long have they been out? and the financial impact of that. The part about who's out for what reasons, that, if you recall, Chief, was asked to provide a summary, non-specifically, and I think I even put in there, do not tell me what each individual person is out for, but in the aggregate, what are the common reasons that we're having all of these workplace injuries? So um, payroll records are all public information. So I, hopefully you're going to get an answer from the law department. I don't know if the law – Mike Bissonnette's here tonight. He's in our meeting. See, he comes to most of the meetings. So hopefully they're going to get on top of this pretty quickly so that they can uh, get answers to these questions. Because citizens have a right to know who's out, how long, and for what, and what it's costing them. They're paying for all of this. So um, I would appreciate if somebody could get to the bottom of some of those questions. Because the problem is we keep getting these requests every two weeks. I need another 25000 I need another 50000 I need more for this. What is going on with all of this? Who is it? Why? We, we don't get answers to these questions. And I was told that we would be getting reporting so that I at least know what exactly I'm even voting on. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councilor Barley. Uh, just through a charitable uh, to the Chief. Chief, uh, good to see you again. Uh, Chief, you, you mentioned the, the PSAP grant. Um, so c can you just remind us what, what, what that is and then what, what do we receive and, and what, when can we anticipate a, uh, a report 
um, pursuant, as you know, city ordinance requires uh, grant awardees to give an annual report. <clears throat> Okay, so the PSAP grant is um, for personnel and equipment. Um, I believe the total, I'm shooting from the hip here a little, I was about 240, uh, 246, I think. And we, we bought some equipment with that, probably 15 or 20,000 of equipment. And then the rest is uh, reimbursable for a salary and overtime. Okay, I, I and just through also, again, I, I think ahead. training too as well. Yeah, chief. So like there's, uh, there's training for the dispatchers that's like mandatory, it's like 16 hours a year. That that comes out of there as well. Right. So, um, so I, I that that that's that's an annual grant that we receive, chief. Yes. Okay. So I, I have not it's received based on your calls for service. Right, so um, if you could just add that to your the list, that uh, on an annual basis, I would, uh, pursuant to city ordinance, we're, we're supposed to receive a, a written report from grant grant awardees for, for any particular grant. So I, I'd like to, uh, hopefully for the next meeting, first meeting of February, the second meeting of February, we, we, we can get a report for last year's uh, uh, PSAP, uh, what, what do we do with the money, that, that, that sort of thing. So for a, any grant that you re, any de department receives, City ordinance says what we're supposed to receive. We, the city council, are supposed to receive a, uh, a, a one-page, one or two-page summary. And you, you can get a, a template summary from uh, Jeff Anderson Burgos uh, on, on how to fill. He'll, 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 he'll forward that uh, right away, okay? So that's one thing. Uh, second off, on the, um, on the uh, burn grant that we tabled at last committee meeting, do, do we get a, is that, do, do we have a, um, a summary of what what its uh, purposes are for uh, sent to us um, for, for the next meeting. That, that's on the city council I agenda, that was and we do. And it's on the next meeting's agenda. Yeah, and we do have that. We do have an email from uh, Sergeant Hart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I'm. I don't remember getting a report for last year's burn grant uh, as well. So I'd like to. I'd, I'd like to see a, a one year summary on what last year's burn grant was. Uh, how much was used for? When it was received? Uh, that, that sort of thing. Just a, just a one pager. Just just to remind us and the public what what is it we're approving. That sure. would be uh, that. Yeah. Thanks, Chief. I really appreciate. Um, yep. And then um, and then uh, lastly, just from a personal standpoint, I'm I'm very grateful for for the work that was done at the mall over the weekend and uh, and and the, uh, the, the 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 quick response by HPD, MSP, and and others as well. I, I think that uh, rhetoric aside, uh, you know, the nonsense that you, you, you know, that I hear about, I don't read it because I don't read social media, but uh, put that to the side, uh, the response and the turnaround uh, by HPD and MSP were, uh, were really uh, second to none. And, uh, and to, to sort of uh, put the uh, arms around that situation and, uh, and the rapid response that you did with uh, that kind of pressure involved uh, says a lot. So thank you. Chief, the uh, auditor is with us this evening. I'm pretty sure she'll back me up. But when a reimbursable grant is received by the city, the reimbursement means the city pays for the, in this case, salary, you know, by budgeting for the salaries of the dispatchers. As you pay for the dispatchers, you then can apply for the reimbursement. We don't exactly get the money in the, into the treasury until we get look for the reimbursement of what we've already paid. I, I think that's, that, that's the... Correct. That's okay. correct. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? I make a motion to be approved. I second. Motion made second that we approve the uh, request. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Passes 5-0. Item number three, introduced under my name for the mayor, the request of transfer of $5,000 from lieutenants to captains. Motion to remove it from the second. table. Motion made second to remove from the table for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Chief? Want to walk us through this one? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the, that's to cover the uh, cost of the captains. It was uh, underfunded at, at budget time, and it was by about $5,000 we need to get to the end of the fiscal year. And we had extra in the lieutenant's line item 
So I moved from lieutenants to captains. Can you just tell us how many lieutenants, how many captains, you know, just so everybody understands? Four, four captains, eight lieutenants. And it's, you had a, was there a promotion or one was a little short and the other just had a little extra? <clears throat> Both. So yeah, it was, it was basically the, the budget um, was done and um, I, you know, it was a miscommunication between myself and the mayor and it just wasn't funded. I, I, had, I had funded it and, and he cut it, but based on our conversation and we were off by about 5,000. Mayor? Yeah, I, I take full responsibility on this one. So you'll recall when we put the budget together, we had funded half the year and remember the debate of whether or not we could fund half a year in a position that was illegally and we did debate it, but we never really revisited it. Um, so it was a half a year, but because of the surpluses that grew in that, it's only about the, a week or, or two weeks, five, the 5,000 gap. Nevertheless, that's what happened. It was that time period when we were debating, is this allowed, is it? But we never really revisited it, and we kind of moved forward anyways. Um, the, the, auditor so I you take, get, the auditor let you get away with that? No, it, <laughs> yeah. remember, we were all here, budget, we, during finance committee, and we were, it was all over the, we were anticipating a retirement. Turned out that person didn't retire, and so it created this this dilemma that we have in front of us, and we never, really went back and, and fixed it during that debate. So that's what happened. I take full responsibility of that, but we'll be sure that when we put the budgets together, positions are fully funded. I'll make a motion to be approved. A second. Motion made a second to approve the request for transfer. Any further discussion? Uh, we also have Councilor Bacon uh, joined us online. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, aye, aye. any opposed, so moved. Motion to take item number four off the table. Second. second. Motion made second to take item number four off the table for discussion. All those in favor, aye. any opposed. This is a uh, request to accept and allow under Mass General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 53A, a grant known as the Student Awareness of <laughs> Fire Education and Senior Safe uh, Grant for $7,958, no match. Grant is authorized the establishment of the fund and methods appropriate for the accounting of the receipts and any expenditures. This is from the governor's office, I believe. Chief, would you like to walk us through it? Chief, I'm sorry, we're switching departments here. Fire chief is here. Fire John, chief. Chief. C. John's Thank you, Chief Pratt. I think we're. <laughs> Thank you. Chief. Chief, hang on, you're breaking up a little bit. Somewhat, yeah. I think so. A little choppy, huh? It's just, it's a little choppy. Very choppy. It's like a lot. I, Chief, I... <laughs> Chief, uh, Chief, we don't have you at all. We're gonna we'll give a couple seconds to see Jeffrey. Is he trying to get in and out? Oh, there he is. All right, Chief, we can see you, but you're muted. Is that any better? That's, That's better. much better. That's better yeah. <laughs> I we, we won't talk about the video. We'll just say that the voice is much better. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Um, welcome. This is this is the grant that they use for the student education, uh, the fire safe education. You'll see uh, Lieutenant Pelcher runs this program. She does a great job with it. Um, you'll see her at all the different events throughout the city on weekends and at the different uh, community events. And this is what she uses to fund that. This is what she uses to buy the, uh, the educational materials that they use um, and also pay like the overtime for the Sparkies and whatever that, that accompany her on this. And who is Sparky these years? Are you allowed to say that? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was uh, Lieutenant Krause is Sparky. Oh. Wow. Any, any discussion? Yep. Councilor Bartlett. Uh, through the chair, uh, uh, and I, I don't know if I can, I, I'll ask the chair to 
advice on this in a minute, but through chair to the chief. Chief, you just heard what I said to the chief of the police. So what we have a say, I mean, this has just got to be explicit uh, going forward. There, there's got to be a, a report about when this grant was received, what the, what the amount was, what it was used for, broken down, and report sent back to the city council. Chief, you're aware of the city ordinance? I I am now, counselor. <laughs> <laughs> Better late than never, as they as they say. But uh, the, the the fact is that uh, it, it it's it's a city ordinance, and, and I know we've had counselors say they're suggestions, but they're actually laws. And so we we, we want to have a uh, we we we, we want to have a report back to us, just to just to summarize what we're what, for the public what it is that the city received, the amounts, the dates, and then what were the funds expended for. Very simple. Yeah, that shouldn't be a, that shouldn't be a problem, Councillor, because we have to do the same thing to account for the money spent in the grant, so. That's that's great, and Jeff Anderson Burgos can, uh, he's developed a beautiful forum. The, the finance chair actually suggested putting these things online, which was a tremendous suggestion uh, at the last meeting, and so so those are gonna be public records, uh, easily accessible by the public, and and, and I, think, I think it'll help all of us going forward, so. Uh, um, so thank you for that. And, uh, and just okay, if, I may, if I may just to, to, to just to the chair as a point of order, chair, uh, is, is this something, um, is this something that we can, we can mandate in, in as part of a, a, a grant, a, receive the grant that, or, or, or should it just be, I mean, it should just be understood by all department heads that they're supposed to report back to us. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what to say about that, but, but we're, we're clearly not getting a clear. It's not happening regularly. So, I, I, if I could answer that, Councilor Bartley, it's a good question. Um, I, I think the, the, the mandate or, or the, the reasons are all are clear, and I think it's out there. I think the timing is not. I will say, at the last time this grant came in, the last, it's, it's Chief, this is more than an annual grant. I think it comes uh, quarterly or maybe not quarterly, but a couple times a year. The last time Lieutenant Pelcher was here, she provided us with a detailed um, list of how the prior round was spent. Hmm. So I, I think she understands it and I think she will provide it upon request. Um, I'm, I'm just speaking for you know knowing she came in and, uh, and gave us a good report on it, but I don't. And I think your your point is, I think maybe the best way we can do it because we we've had emails, we've had Sergeant Hart send us emails on sub, on grants from the uh, police department. Uh, we've had other um, emails. We've had Yoni come in and give us the details of how the grants, you know, the ongoing uh, conservation grants are being spent in terms of the trees and everything. I think it's just a, a, just collecting it, and I talked to uh, Jeff about not maybe not just finance, but we, we need to identify what I call an archive committee re, committee jacket of all this information, and I think we need to identify this particular information coming in because it's not necessarily stuff up for discussion, but information that we like to have readily available, especially when we vote for. The next go around on the annual grants. Well, what I'm just thinking is that it, it, this is a city ordinance, and so we can cut and paste the actual city ordinance to the to the order that comes out of city council when it goes back to the uh, department head. So you've got you've got the five member committee report that, that you, the five of you are going to sign, and then once it, once it cycles through city council, you can staple you can staple to the city ordinance right to that order, so it's crystal clear. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to put the chief on the spot because it's not fair. Because he, he's not the only one. It's every department head, but but very few, uh, you know, don't regularly comply unless they're unless they're reminded. So it just it's a suggestion. I don't know if we can do it. Maybe we have to coordinate with Jeff and the president of city council. But it is in law. That's so. It's more than a suggestion. It's an actual law. And so I'm hopeful that um, that we can. And it's not just for us, Joe. It's it's for you know future city councils beyond us that that really want you know this is the way they can be educated uh, on this as well. So it's not like it's uh, I mean you and you know we've done this now multiple year after year after year. But for newer councilors in particular, what are these things? What is going on with these grants? You know what what's their purpose? 
And, and then also when it comes to budget time, it, it would be very helpful to some, have this at our fingertips as well. So thank you. That's just yeah, that's, 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 that's the completion yeah, form. Okay. And there's the form. The uh, Wizard of Oz has put the, uh, a copy of the grant <laughs> form completion up on the screen for us, Councillor Bartley. So I think, I think, and I, and I agree. I, I think the ordinance is important. I think the request speaks for itself. Actually, I like that a lot. And the wizard, the wizard could send that right to all the department heads right yeah. when we do the grants. And, yeah. and I know the grand wizard of Oz sitting out there. You know, Who's that? The, the you know Mayor Garcia will certainly work with uh, with the department heads to make sure that the uh, we, we get this information timely as, as possible. Any further discussion on this very important grant? I make a motion to approve the grant. Motion made a second to approve. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Adopted, and we'll go to the City Council next Tuesday. Motion to take item five off the table. Second. Motion made a second to take item five off the table. Introduce under my name for the mayor another grant. Mass General Laws 44, Section 53A. The City Council accepts the provisions of the Fiscal 23 Firefighter Safety Equipment. $24,978, no match, authorizes the establishment of fund and or other method appropriate for the accounting of the receipts and expenditures of all resources associated with said grant. Off the table, all those in favor and Aye. opposed, so moved. Uh, Chief, welcome. Want to walk us through this one, please? Yeah, this is a grant that I believe was approved for five years, and I think this is the second of the five years. Um, and it's just to help uh, fire departments be able to have the money to purchase different types of equipment that are deemed uh, necessary by the state. They, they kind of um, rate them as what's going to be a high priority and what's going to be medium and low priorities. And they try to get the grants to the people who have high priority needs. Um, we're going to be using it to buy a couple of different types of equipment. Um, we're going to be getting a couple of battery power, what are called positive pressure ventilation fans. And those are what we use to move the smoke out of the buildings, either after a fire or any kind of a smoke condition or even any kind of a gas condition. Um, we're going to be using it to purchase a second set of hoods uh, for our firefighters. So those are the ones that go with the, the um, they call it the turnout gear. That's the personal protective equipment they wear during a fire situation. Um, it's a recommended thing. We, through through Grant and then through ARPA, have been able to um, get a second set of the actual turnout gear. Um, and now with this, we'll be able to get the second set of hoods. Um, and what that's for is so that one can be laundered while one's used so that we don't have to wear the ones with the carcinogens. Um, they found links to like cancer in your face and jaw lines and different types of skin cancers. Um, and then to end off, we're gonna be buying uh, eight sets of tactical gear, which would be like a ballistic vest and helmet in order to uh, comply with the new way they want us to respond to active shooter and hostile events. Um, did you say vest? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's vests with uh, plates and helmets. And that's part of what they're, the new, the new system is you're gonna do a rescue task force. So after the police mitigate what they feel is the threat, um, you'll have a task force with a police officer who's armed and they'll take through the EMS teams to start triaging and moving victims out. Discussion. Question. Um, so if the police go in and catch all the bad guys before you come in and rescue the people or whatever emergencies, why why would you need helmets and bulletproof vests and stuff? Like I'm, my fear is are our firefighters being shot at or potentially shot at by bad guys? It Wouldn't it seem, or are you going in with them in the first instance like right away? Or is it? It's, it or is it? Part uh, of the, huh? It's kind of like part of the second wave of it, uh, Counselor. But it's if they mitigate a situation in that area, and you're wearing it in case you know, like you know, uh, events can be very dynamic, right. and what was once a warm area can become a hot area again. So it's that extra level of precaution. But what they've learned through the the myriad of active shooter events throughout the country is that 
it's critical to get people in to start doing uh, life-saving measures and getting people out um, because if you wait, it's just more people end up dying. Right, right. No, it makes perfect sense. I guess uh, thank you for for explaining that. Uh, makes all the sense in the world, especially if you had some sort of crazy situation where you guys had to go in to rescue people you know, with the police or behind the police, either or. Exactly. Well, thank, thank you for doing that. Any further discussion? Motion to approve the second. Grant. Motion made second to approve the acceptance of the grant and setting up the necessary funding of uh, expenditures and receipts. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? And this will go to the uh, City Council next Tuesday. Item. Motion, motion to, to take, take six off the six. table. Motion made second to take item six off the table. Introduce under my name for the mayor, Mass General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 53A. The City Council hereby accepts the provisions of the 2022-2023 Marcot Ford Fire Equipment Donation. We have an estimated value of $9,890.52. We are authorizing the acceptance of the establishment of a fund and or other method appropriate for the counting of the receipts and expenditures and resources of this donation. It's off the table for discussion. All those in favor? Any opposed? Sounds like a wonderful gift, uh, Chief. Do you want to walk us through it, please? Yeah, this was part of the uh, Battle of the Chefs that myself and Chief Pratt had done. Um, and part of that, partic for participating in it, they wanted to make a donation of up to $10,000 to the department. Um, we asked if we'd be able to work with them to you know, get some equipment that we needed that we otherwise wouldn't have probably had the money to get. Um, with it, we're going to be buying extra, what's, uh, extrigation gloves. Um, and those are gloves we'd be using at uh, car accidents and different events where our structural firefighting gloves don't offer the proper protection. And we're doing this hoping to uh, reduce hand injuries um, on those types of scenes. Um, we're upgrading what's called our rapid intervention team bags. Um, that's a bag where you bring breathing air in to a fire scene where you have a man down. So if you have a or, I won't say me and a firefighter down in the building on like a mayday and you have to go in to rescue them. This gives you the ability to either get them to breathe off this bottle you bring in or refill their bottle if they had run out of air. Um, they're gonna be getting a little bit of tech, um, some tech rescue equipment that we otherwise hadn't had the ability to get also just some, uh, for we really use that more when we have people down on the mountain. Thank you. And that was uh, quite the event, and it's uh, a tribute to you and the uh, the other the, your counterpart, and also a tribute to Marcot Ford at uh, was it Lugnuts Cafe, I believe. Lugnuts. Yes, sir. Lugnuts okay. Cafe. Okay. So, so, so I have a question, Councilor Jardine. Did you beat Chief Pratt? That's why your department's getting the money. <laughs> no, he he put the screws to me, Councilor. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Well, hey, great job by all involved. I, I got the trophy here if you'd like to see it. <laughs> <laughs> where's where's your ten thousand? You how come how come the police didn't get the ten didn't get ten thousand? What no, happened here? It's, it's customary to let the loser go first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. oh. he's right. always a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, I make a motion to be approved, Mr. Yes, motion made a second that we approve the acceptance of, of the grant and allow it to be spent accordingly. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Motion to take item seven off the table. Second. Motion to make a second to take item seven off the table. This is introduced by our president, Councillor McGee, in order that the fire department station's revolving fund be updated to remove language, payments received by Action Ambulance, and replace it with payments received by the uh, city's contracted ambulance provider, which is now Cotaldo. Off the table for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. This was supposed to be just housekeeping, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Because... To make it more generic, as I understand it, I don't know if we need a. Hey, maybe a, just if, if the uh, auditor could just quickly tell us what you need. So, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. In the um, in the current revolving fund, it specifically says like lease and rent payments through Cataldo, and we would just like it to say like rental and lease payment for fire stations or anything like that. So that way, when the revenue comes in. It doesn't matter who is renting it. It right. goes into that fund for, for like maintenance of those buildings. 
Yeah. Okay, then I mistakenly ad libbed there by saying Cattell, though. We don't want any mention of, uh, we just want it to be as Councilor Jardine said, generic. Because I think it used to say yes. action, <coughs> so now we want to make it generic so it applies to anybody. anybody yeah, it says action, and so, like, as the auditor, I'm like, exactly. oh, it yeah. needs to be just lease payments. No, you're right. Wrong. Yeah. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to add that when there, it comes when it comes to revolving, like it it has to whatever it says is what it has to be. So anything different, exactly. So if it's it says uh, uh, action is something else, and we can't put money, like we shouldn't be putting money in there. That's like right, it right. has to be exactly That's what right. it's titled. So okay. make a motion to be adopted, Mr. Chairman. Motion a second to Hello. adapt. Oh, no. Councilor Bartley. Question. Hello. Under discussion, Councilor yeah. Bartley. Yeah, thank you. Didn't miss that hand there. Quick on the draw, that's why you're the vice chair. Um, <laughs> I'm in training. Oh, my oh, friend. Yeah. That's Educate my, me. That's my friend, Dr. Jordan. He, he, can, he can take it. Uh, just through the chair to the auditor. Um, auditor, would you tell us what, where, where are we with our balance right now? What, what, what's going on with this fund? Uh, why don't you give us a little update on what's happening with the, with the repairs to the, to the various stations? Because that was the purpose of this whole thing. So I can tell you there's $53,000 in that account right now and that and maybe the the fire chief can speak better on you know what repairs are taking place but i know that he's working with the dpw currently and they're looking at the different fire stations and deciding you know what maintenance needs to be done but i'm going to let him speak more on that because i well, know chief thank you uh, madam honor uh through chair to the chief chief where are we with this I said the um, right now I I, we had to figure out where so Money was going in from the 490 South Street building. Um, and I believe within their lease agreement, uh, it's very specific as to their money needs to be spent on upkeep of that building or invested into that building. Um, so we had to work to figure out what money went to them and what money went to us for our stations. Um, and with the money in our stations, we're looking to do a couple different upgrades. We need to get some, uh, work done up at station six and we need to get some work done at headquarters. We're looking to, we have to upgrade the camera system at our headquarters. We're looking to do that in the near future. And we have to have a pow some power and water run for a, a gear extractor. It's pretty generic as to, you know, what kind of upkeep we can do. Um, but we, we, you know, in the past, I know Chief Pond had done a, a roof on station three with it. Um, I believe they had done some bay doors at Station 3 also. Well, Chief, just through the chair, Chief, have you been by 490 South Street lately? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, well, I'm sure you you agree with me that the caution tape flying all over the yard over there is not a great look. I mean, I, I don't know if you would like to live next to that caution tape all around the yard, but I, I know I wouldn't like to look at it constantly all day long for months upon end. Um, what, what, what do we think? Can we get a fence there? Can we can we put, throw some grass seed out with the fifty three thousand? What what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure Sean will figure out something to do with it. Uh, as far as that station, I know he has to do some uh, concrete work there. That's going to be in the tune of uh, just basically when he was throwing around. I don't know exactly what the work he has to do is, but they have about ten thousand dollars worth of concrete work to do up there also, um, right at where it goes into the base from the front pad. Um, I think Frank said last night that he was going to be taking care of that caution tape and getting something else there. I believe he did say he was going to take care of that. Oh no, I, I, he did say it, and I'm aware of that. But I'm, I'm not letting it go till they, till the, uh, till the caution <laughs> tape is removed. It's still there. I don't. So, I don't blame you, Counselor. Yeah, I don't yeah, blame so, you. Well, you're not the one getting the calls. I, I am. If it was my building, Frank. it'd be a lot easier to deal with. But uh, it's. Just, just for clarification, South Street uh, Fire Station, now leased by Cataldo, uh, is in Ward 3, Councilor Bartley's ward. We did meet last night, DGR. The chair of DGR has joined us, Tessa Murphy Rambaletti on Zoom. Uh, we did meet with the Cataldo people, the chief, and we went over the lease and went over a lot of what this uh, revolving fund is, but the revolving fund is part of finance, obviously. Mayor, do you want to answer something? Yeah, I was just going to tell clarify some things. So <clears throat> when the chief referenced, right, so you had... Can he use his microphone? The mic, yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, so there was 
space that was being rented out at the time with action in the actual fire station. So there's the rental income from that. And then there was a rental income that we had agreed for the South Street station, which we never collected at all. I think it was like $15,000 worth of funds that we were able to collect. Um, and it, it's, it's being, it, it got put into that account. So when the chief is referencing South Street and the stations, that's what's going on. There's, we're trying to like keep track of what South Street Street Station has contributed and then what the other um, stations have contributed through those rental incomes. There has been some projects the previous chief have worked on uh, in, the, in the stations. As far as the South Street Station is concerned, there are capital needs that are needed there. I know when we hired finally the building maintenance guy, Sean Sheedy, um, one of the things that I've told him was that there's some need over there and, and to work with the folks and try to understand what the capital needs are of that building, there is X amount of funds in this revolving account we can tap into, but anything greater than that, let me know so that we can plan for and accordingly in our own capital improvement um, objectives. Um, and then there's also the whole other conversation. We don't have to accomplish this tonight, but the potential, potential of um, if whether or not we even wanna keep this building. And if we keep this building, great, let's make these investments. If we're not keeping this building, you know, then that there was a debate there as to, you know, why invest in it if we're going to be giving it away. I'm not saying that we are. I'm just saying it was the conversation. So there, there's there's some history with the South Street building. I know Sean has been actively looking at what the needs are, so that I can come with a plan and help bring some resolutions to these issues at the South Street station. Um, but also there has been those informal discussions like, what are, what's the future of this building? and um, its relationship with the city of Hoyoke. So um, that's, you know, that's where that is. Mr. Chair. Mr. Barley. Yeah, to the chair. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Mayor, for the update, as, as always. Um, who's Sean Sheedy? Oh. The building maintenance supervisor? DPW. Under, DPW. Under Public Works? Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, second of all, uh, did you say we were having trouble with collections? Relative, are we caught up with collections relative to our past contracts with Action, and are we current with Cataldo? Yep, one hundred percent. Okay, so I, I, that was a red flag that went up, but but that 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 was a, a non-issue because if uh, our finance chair and members are, remember, uh, we didn't collect from uh, Action for months upon months upon months, and then fin and finally they coughed it up uh, the the rental money, but that was uh, that was a contractual issue with. Uh, with past mayors, and we'll we'll leave that comment for another day. We're still looking for the money from Gondera. Yeah. Um, There's more money. Well, uh, well, <laughs> well the, the that was editorial. Sorry. No, uh, I uh, actually the the uh, finance chair is right, but that that was a relevant. Uh, uh, but, but I don't know, don't know if we want to. We're not. We're an open meeting, so we. Oh. We have to comply with open media laws. So I don't want to go Gondera okay, at this point, but that was another story. Okay, so we're, we're caught up. Sean Sheedy's uh, the, the maintenance guy. Um, relative to what the mayor raised, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I would only say that that, that was a, um, I hadn't heard anything to date relative to conveying our interest at 490 South Street. I have never heard that once. So I would be, um, I would just say let's uh, let's you know, let's put a little caution at, at that one. Um, uh, from, frankly, I, I, that was the first I, first that I've heard that at all in my career uh, about 490 South Street not being part of the uh, Holyoke portfolio. So I guess I'd want to uh, I, I guess I would want to want to understand that. And then if uh, I would imagine if that if those words are being talked about, I would hope that there's a, a, a larger plan about where and now's not the time. But I hope there's a larger plan about where where the ambulance service is going to go. I mean, right now they're pretty well centrally located when they're on South Street, whether you're going uptown or downtown or north and south. I mean, you have pretty fast access to anywhere from that location. So I would be I'd be hard pressed to imagine another location that would be anywhere close to the uh, proximate uh, proximity to other areas in Holyoke as 490 South Street. So. I wouldn't want to just say those words unless they were uh, unless they were serious. So, so let's just um, we'll, we'll table we'll uh, put that one to the side for now, Mr. Chairman. But um, 
But if a discussion is going to be had, then I think it's got to be had by all of us. Thank you. Councilor Jourdain. The only thing I heard about the sale on that topic was there was a discussion. I don't know if you heard that at finance, but maybe six months ago or whenever the decision was made that there was a discussion about us selling Cataldo, yeah. our building. I think we kind of put a cold blanket on that idea. So I don't know if there's some other deal going, but that that one I wasn't particularly warm to because, well, I won't I won't rehash my comments from that meeting. Uh, I'll just leave. I'll rest on what I said at that time. Question: Did I? I was just, I think I was listening carefully. Where we were renting the building to Action, they owed us rent. Okay, we're renting to Cataldo. They pay us money. Okay, that's fine. There's another slot. There's other people renting, or is there anybody? Okay. Was there somebody before? That there was a action ambulance that was stationed at our fire stations. So there was a rental agreement at that time at those other buildings, other stations. Oh, interesting. Yep. And um, is that something that was relatively recent? That was at that time with that ambulance contract when it was created. Um, that's not being practiced now, right, Chief? They're not at any of our stations. No, at the, uh, Counselor, yeah. they, they are. We still have an oh, ALS unit uh, out of Station 5 on Waiting Farms Road. Um, they run a advanced life support unit out of there. Um, so they're housed there. And we have two of their dispatchers in our dispatch center. Um, the reason why it's good to have them in our dispatch center is just a good communication. It slows uh, that lag time it takes to getting everyone out the door, especially us. Um, and it, I think it just it provides a much better service to the citizens with, because they can have that communication right there instead of a phone call from wherever they would be dispatching from otherwise. Can, Chief, can we? Or, okay. And can the city council get a, the finance committee get a copy of that contract that we have that allows them and what they're paying us for rent and what the arrangements are and how that money is being handled? DGR is important to Go ahead, Chief. I believe uh, Councillor Bartley brought that up uh, last night's meeting and oh, basically okay. said that you guys, it's going to have to go. They should be approved by you guys anyways because it's a, a leasing agreement. Um, so I believe he was already taking care of that, but I'm not, I don't want to speak for him. Okay. So um, just so I understand, but I, I guess I was under the impression, if I have it correct, that they're already doing this. That they're already stationing yeah. at these other places. Yes, sir. Okay, and so there's an agreement to cover that already. Yes, sir. Or, oh, okay. So that's the agreement I'm looking for. The one that is because <clears throat> you said it was Action, not Cataldo, and that they're continuing to stay there. Correct. The Action was in those stations. Um, they were there until COVID kicked in, and then uh, then Chief Preskopowski had because of obvious public health issues he had moved them out of the stations okay. um when the covid crisis ended uh and cataldo took, took over we brought him back in um we didn't there's issues they at the time action was in action three of our stations they were running out of uh station three on northampton street um they were running out of station five on whiting farms road they were actually running a unit out of headquarters um Cataldo wasn't looking to do that. Um, station three ended up being where we didn't have the proper living quarters for them. And it wasn't a place, you know what I mean, where we should have people, extra people living there. We barely, we just have enough room for our personnel that are there. Um, there was, they had a bathroom downstairs that ended up getting uh, condemned and it's not being used as a bathroom anymore due to the uh, sewer issue. So, now they're not there um we still have them running out of station five like i said on whiting farms road the same as they had an als unit from action running out of uh, station five on whiting farms road and at the time at headquarters we had both dispatch and a bls ambulance running out of uh, headquarters on high street um they didn't want to have anything there other than the dispatch 
So, Chief, just so I'm clear, is is this a contract for leasing of space? Is this was this part of their operating agreement with that they had with the city, or was this a separate standalone agreement? Um, I believe I, it's a standalone agreement. I believe, Councillor. Um, again, I didn't negotiate any of it, so I'm not sure. That was the law department. Um, Okay, so if you could send us a copy of that standalone agreement to the city council so we can review that. I just want to make sure that that's something that the, the mayor and the council both approve since that's the leasing of public space. Oh. I would, want to, I would we, want to see a copy. Did, did, clarification, the lease, I think it's the only lease chief that uh, was taken up in DGR last night and that will be coming to the full city council. But that's for the future. That's the current. No. Nope. Yeah. That's for the one going on now, Councillor. Yeah. Well, hold on. You must have already had one ratified some number of years ago. If this has been going on for years, the question is what's been covering all of these past years? Oh, the past years, I, I can't speak to that, Councillor. I'm, okay. I'm not sure. Well, there, there's got to be a document. All right. There, there's an agreement somewhere. Okay, good. So those, if someone could just. was here, because I remember when I was at the fire commission. Okay. Those terms are somewhere. Paul Payer worked on that agreement. Okay, uh, a big part of it was the change of uh, the, the vendor, you know, to Cataldo. It's it's the, pretty yeah. much the same language. But I, I, what Councillor Durain is saying, and brought, we brought this up a little bit last night, Chief, too. We, we stopped short of getting into a lengthy discussion is the ambulance companies, you know, they, they're, they're here because we want them for first responders for emergencies. But they also and make their money the bulk of their money on transportation, and 30% of their calls, the dispatchers, are transportation issues with the Hoyoke Medical uh, Center itself. And, and that's fine, you know, that's important, but they're using city space to do that work. We shouldn't be afraid to ask them for some good money for the lease. Well, absolutely. I mean, the fact of it is, we're providing them free buildings if, if we're not getting paid, so it has to be, commercially reasonable no more than any citizen could say hey can i park my pickup truck in one of your fire headquarters i mean why don't they have a yeah. right to public space unless someone's paying for that so um uh, i just want the, they, counselor they are paying, it's they're giving us fifteen hundred dollars a month for the bay you know to have their als unit at station five and they're giving us 500 uh double check but I believe it's 500 a month to have uh, their dispatch in our dispatch center. Okay, great. So whatever's been covering us for the past, and then I'll review the new one that's for the go forward. But yeah, that'll okay. be... And now we're planning to allow, even though we've switched services to Cataldo, it's the intent to still allow them, this other company, to continue to rent those spaces? What? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. I, back to the revolving fund. <laughs> but it sounds like all this money, what, regard, whether it's just for, the, for South Street or not, all of the money has been going into this one account from all sources. That's my understanding. Yes, sir. Auditor, yeah. chief, auditor, I'm sure that's the case. Okay. And that is why the question was asked or raised about now you're trying to decide how to split the money because this is this account is supposed to be not just for South Street, it's supposed to be for all buildings. Yes, sir. And I believe the auditor had, had a plan to do that. It, she could probably speak on it better than I can. The auditor is raising her hand. <laughs> so I do want to say that the only um, checks that have not gone into the general fund is Cataldo. So if they were getting any other lease payments, I can, I can guarantee they went to the general fund revenue. Uh, and right now, as far as these contracts are concerned, we've separated out the revenues and we've separated out the expenses so that the DPW can spend their money and the fire department can spend their money as appropriate as according to their lease. Do you think these past checks should have went just into the general fund or should they have gone into this account in your opinion? I want to say that the Cataldo checks, I feel like this special revenue account was created for the Cataldo checks. Right, right. Yeah. But I don't have a copy of the agreement, but that was in place. So yeah, I feel like 
I feel like that's what it was created for. So the Cataldo checks and these checks should be. But I'd like the wording to be a little more broad. And if we want it to be real broad and other people, I wasn't aware other people were doing any rentals. But if that's the case, then and we put it as broad as we want to, all of that money should probably go in there so that they can maintain the buildings. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world to me. Uh, it seems that if we're collecting any rental revenue, it should be designated into one account for tracking. And it, there should be agreements that match how much we're supposed to be getting paid for leasing of fire department space or DPW space if the building's been transferred to the DPW a la South Street. And it, all that rental income should be going into one account for tracking with, uh, with contracts to support those amounts. If that's not happening, then that's what should happen going forward. Any further discussion? Okay. General, take a motion that we do this. I make a motion change. to change to the, uh, the motion to second fund. to adopt the request and make this generic change in the language. All, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. So moved. Motion to take item number eight off the table. Sorry, okay. Introduced under my name, for the mayor, in accordance with Mass General Laws, Matt, Chapter 44, Section 53A, the City Council hereby accepts the provisions of the Advancing Climate, Resilience, and Health Through Urban Forestry Grant of 13500 No match, set up the establishment of the fund and appropriate methods for the accounting of receipts and <coughs> expenditures of all resources with the administration of said grant. Off the table, all those in favor, any Aye. opposed? We are just joined by Yoni Glogower, our conservation director. Yoni, welcome. Would you like to walk us through this grant? Absolutely, thank you. Um, this is another grant that's going to add to our efforts to complete Holyoke's first public tree inventory. Uh, the council might uh, remember the DCR urban and community forestry grant that we got for $30,000. Um, that got us most of the way completed with our public tree inventory. We think there's about 800 left to get in the Rock Valley area. Um, and so what this grant that came about through the Conservation Law Foundation is going to allow us to do is complete that inventory and also provide us with some analysis of the results. So we'll have some breakdown on uh, species composition, the varying states of the trees, how many are in good condition, how many need uh, severe pruning to be brought into decent condition, um, the size and diameter class, really give us a picture of what it all looks like put together. Um, and I just met with uh, Davy Resource Group, who we've contracted to do the first part of the work, um, and our city forester, John Tuig. We all sat down and talked about what data might be most useful for the city to understand. So we'll be doing all that analysis. We're going to be looking at options for expanding a tree planting program in Holyoke and what that might look like. And I forget what else we talked about. It's all going to be good stuff. And oh, Davey is going to be able to give a public presentation of their results to the uh, city council will be invited to. Um, so that's uh, the basics of the grant. It's through the Conservation Law Foundation. I think the funding ultimately comes from Wells Fargo um, through Conservation Law Foundation. I'm not exactly sure how that came about, but it's an opportunity that was presented to Holyoke and other communities that are doing this similar urban forestry planning work. Um, they reached out to me and encouraged me to think of a project to apply for. And it seemed to make most sense to bring the present uh, free inventory effort to a logical conclusion. Uh, it's $13,500 towards the inventory and analysis and uh, no match requirement. And I believe we'll even be getting the funds up front instead of a reimbursement based grant. Um, the goal is to have all of the activities done really within the next few months. We can move pretty quickly on the rest. Um, so we should be seeing the results sometime in March is what we're expecting. Thank you, Yoni. Any questions? Just one quick question. Councilor Jordan. Uh, Yoni, is it that we obviously will vote to approve this? I certainly will. I'm sure others will. Um, 
you now will what hire a vendor to do this work or is this something they arrange uh and then you give them the money type of like how do, how does it seems like wow you can just get it done that quick that's great yeah they move pretty quickly we're gonna probably hire a db resource group we hired them as a vendor <clears throat> through the previous grant um they're urban forestry professionals um they do a lot of these inventories for major cities so what i think we'll do is see if we can do a change order to that uh, existing contract and just add on the extra services okay great thank you i make a motion to be approved second. motion made a second to approve accept the uh, acceptance of the grants and recommend that to the full city council there's no further discussion all those in favor aye, aye. Any opposed so moved yoni thank you good timing Thank you. Have a good Thanks, evening. Joan. Have a good night. We are 10 minutes behind on a very aggressive schedule. The next part of our agenda centers around uh, revenue uh, uh, forecasting. Uh, first, a presentation by the mayor and our consultant, and then some orders that are related and maybe not related to, the, uh, to this discussion. Um, with that in mind, uh, Mayor Garcia, did you want to start? You, you know you're always welcome to come in and sit. Mm. I like to respect the council's spaces. All and right. Go ahead. So tonight we're going to present the, the five-year forecast model. Um, the person presenting it tonight, you've met her before, um, Andrea from the Kinshire CPA firm, who's, who we contracted with to work on this forecast model. Thanks uh, to the council, you recall when we put together a series of um, uh, requests using free cash to work on certain projects, to hire consultants to work on projects. This was one of them. And so for about a half a year or so, uh, Andrea has been working on this. And before I, I, I pass it on to her, I just wanted to kind of set the table a little bit and have folks understand that what's being presented tonight is a, it's a forecast model budgetary tool uh, that we get to populate different data to allow us to forecast out two, three, four, up to five fiscal years what the budget impact can be. Um, and again, you know, obviously, as you know, in local government, there's, you know, it's constantly a moving target, the budget. You know, there's always unanticipated things that happened. You would project a 5% increase in insurance. Next thing you know, it's a 15%. Hopefully, it'll never be that. Um, uh, what's, what is predictable mostly is contractual uh, related um, uh, data that gets populated into the model. Uh, you put in your, your, your assumptions on capital needs, you put in uh, uh, assumptions on increase or decrease in taxation, and it produces an outcome, a, a, a number that uh, allows us to kind of keep our finger on the pulse um, to guess more or less the direction we're going as we prioritize uh, city resources. So it's a really neat model. Um, Andrea is going to present um, uh, the model with some, some assumptions as we know it or basic assumptions as we know it. Uh, certainly, you know, um, uh, I remember talking to Kevin, C Councilor Jordan, and making a reference. You're going to be like a kid in a candy shop because <laughs> you can play with it and make your own guesses on things, which is neat. Um, we'll have um, uh, the, uh, the master document here that you know the auditor and myself and Andrew will play with here and then you know I can hand over a, a play model uh, but certainly you know based on discussions that we've had on the past on several different projects you know again this is just another tool we can use to our benefit to help us understand impact and and plan accordingly, you know, areas where we need to pivot to make the kind of investments that, that we want to see or um, uh, pivots in areas and investments we're already making that we might not want to make anymore or whatever the case may be. So uh, I'm hoping that this, this tool is, you're going to find useful and beneficial. I certainly am looking forward to, to work with it. Um, uh, and, you know, I guess with that being said, uh, through the chair, when you're ready, uh, if you want to just introduce Andrea. Just quick housekeeping. I thank you for the introduction, and we are ready. Um, just note that if we could, the chair would just ask the committee to suspend rules. We'll take item 9 and 10 together. As I said, it leads into more items right after this. But 9 was introduced by Councillor McGee that we invite the mayor in for this uh, presentation. 
and 10 is the actual five-year forecast workbook as presented. On a motion to uh, take up together, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. And our consultant, Andrea, can you, are you with yes, us? hello. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, out of respect for the uh, FinCom's um, time, what I'd like to do tonight really is to um, go along with what um, the mayor said and, and that sort of uh, set the table. So by way of introduction um, or kickoff for what we've come up with for a uh, new forecast model for the city. So um, several months ago, we embarked on this project to develop a five-year financial model or, or forecasting tool for the city. And um, a f the results of this effort were provided to the council a couple of weeks ago in a 15-page document. So hopefully um, the full council as well as the uh, uh, FinCom subcommittee um, have seen that and um, it's something that we'll be referring to and working with over the next several weeks or months. Tonight I'd like to provide you with uh, you know, introduction to what we have developed and why. So by way of introduction, the city's forecast workbook was designed to provide a consolidated view of funds used for the DLS, or the Division of Local Services Tax Rate Setting Process. So we didn't want to create something completely foreign and, and difficult for everyone to use. So the, the nice thing about this is that it follows your tax rate setting process. Along with that, it's been designed to be updated annually with the city's most recent approved budget. So rather than coming up with a very complicated uh, model for you workbook that is sort of stuck in stone until you uh, put in a lot of effort several years later, sort of advance those assumptions and so forth, this is something that we um, start off each and every year um, with somewhat of a clean slate. So we want to provide you with something that has uh, great functionality and flexibility. And finally, um, as the mayor alluded to, there are a lot of assumptions that we have to go by. So um, the assumptions are set to be changed at any time, which would trigger a review of the update over the uh, five-year forecast period that you're looking at. Um, we've set on providing you a, a five-year window into the future, certainly, um, each year we're going to be changing some of those assumptions which could change the model. Um, and typically you want to look at your, your more recent years, um, particularly as you're getting to do your next budget cycle. But it's, it's helpful to have, we think, a five-year um, five window. And we'll demonstrate um, why that is later on in the process as we actually go through the model. Some key considerations. What is it that we need to be focused on? And so we, we've been um, discussing that, researching the city, and that really means that we, we make sure that we understand and account for what funds play a, a major role in what we're dealing with, and that's the tax levy each year. So um, primarily dealing with the general fund. We also look at the community preservation fund that's in, that's in um, force right now with the city, as well as your wastewater enterprise. So those three funds are critical to the tax rate setting process. They all work together and um, um, play uh, together, so to speak, um, in those decisions that you have to make each and every year to manage the tax rate setting process. Then finally, excuse me, uh, working from home makes it difficult. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, we want to look at the, the budget considerations. So we have these three funds. We want to break those down into um, the key pieces. So we're focusing on the operating expenditures, expenditures, your capital spending, and then other special continuing uh, funds or appropriations such as uh, 
RRAs, receipts, reserve appropriations, overrides, special revenue funds, and so forth that feed into um, our tax rate setting picture each year. So looking further at our key considerations um, for this type of project, assumptions. So if you have your package in front of you, certainly we'll be providing um, uh, this in greater detail over the coming weeks. But on page one of your workbook are a list of assumptions. We, we break those assumptions out into the different pieces that we're looking at. So obviously revenues are important. And for the most part, revenues are, I'm not going to say easy, but they're, they're, they're easier for us to identify, uh, look at trends and so forth. So we wanna look at revenues, why? Obviously, um, we need to know what's required to present a balanced budget each year. And then also what's available and allowed for Massachusetts general laws. Um, there haven't been too many major changes since uh, the Modernization Act of 2017, but still we need to delve into those um, laws that are on the books and make sure that what we're considering um, is possible, and then also how are the operations within that special fund or area um, going to interact with with our overall budgeting decision. So we always want to have a, a key focus on what comes before the council each year to vote um, to vote those budgets, make those amendments, and so forth. Then we want to look at our different types of expenditures or spending. So we want to take a, a deeper dive into your operating expenditures. We look at personal services, which um, we commonly refer to as uh, wages, salaries, and other types of compensation. We want to look at another key uh, driver in the budget process, and that's your employee benefits. Then we want to look at your non-discretionary programmatic spending, such as the purchase services, program supply, excuse me, safety and training, and things of that nature that um, that really due to contracts um, and obligations, sometimes um, actual you know mandates, we, we, we don't have that much control over them. Any forecast model you know that we're dealing with draws from so many different assumptions. So we we had to start somewhere to build a, a clear picture. Continuing with our assumptions, we want to look at capital spending. Capital spending um, shows up in a few different places in, in the budget process for any town or city. We look at and we see quite regularly our debt service. We use debt service for major projects and fixed assets. So that's, that's um, in our operating budget. Then we want to consider cash capital for fixed assets. Sometimes that might be something that we build into the operating budget and therefore um, you know, pay down or, or pay toward um, sort of smaller to medium um, expenditures that are paid by the tax levy. And then of course, um, we're looking at reserves, primarily free cash, but you might um, need to or want to use some of your general stabilization and certainly more and more communities are looking at utilizing special purpose stabilization uh, for, for different types of capital. The other big thing which is difficult for uh, a community to um, really wrap their, their um, hands around would be what we'd consider deferred maintenance. So you have those defer the deferred maintenance and those other large expenditures that may not really even be capitalized. We talk about them as capital um, primarily because they're so big. These expenditures are, are big and they might be toward maintaining a building, uh, replacing a fire truck and, and, or, or, or um, repairing a fire truck and so forth. Those are large expenses that we should be looking at and making sure that we're not cutting back on that part of our operating budget so much 
or from what we're doing on the tax levy every year, that the deferred maintenance gets to a point where, you know, you've you've had a, a complete erosion in your your buildings and your rolling stock and, and things of that nature. So there are some things that you can do um, in terms of trying to gauge when those assets need to be um, maintained. And then there's other things um, such as a uh, different types of studies that um, could be expensive. They may be very necessary, but they're really not something that we're going to be capitalizing or, or bonding for. So we, we need to kind of throw in some of those um, sort of larger items that don't quite fit in to our annual plan or they, they, um, they don't have as much of a, an impact when it comes to putting it up against needing a new fire engine or adding um, some more patrol officers, et cetera. So in getting started, we, read it, we really said, well, you know, there's a lot to, to dig into. Um, so, you know, we realized, well, we need to get, we need to start somewhere. So where do we start? We, we came up with our set of assumptions and on page three of that, that workbook or that booklet that we provided gives you a, a nice summary of where we, where we are with the set of assumptions that you see at the front of that packet. So we want to then, um, you know, start looking at that and, and running through the numbers with different people, different stakeholders, um, bringing in that historical um, institutional knowledge, and then really um, go back to those chain, uh, go back to those assumptions on page one, and and change them, and and be prepared to do that on a regular basis. But ultimately, um, what we need to do is determine um, what is historically relevant or important currently desired or necessary, and most especially what's affordable um, in the perspective of the city. So, you know, the workbook aside from providing you different financial outcomes helps develop the picture of what is affordable. So um, just kind of laying them out there in, in, a, in a general way, you know, we want to make sure that we're understanding the whole picture and what the workbook does and clearly what it doesn't. We want to understand the starting assumptions and adjust them as needed and I'm sure there's going to be um, several that um, will uh, perhaps end up on the on the cutting floor and, and be um, adjusted as needed. And then to really kick things off, we want to improve or expand on the inputs that we have right now. What does that mean in terms of improving the inputs? Really, it's, it's a matter of, of testing our assumptions. By going through, um, over the last several um, months, the um, city's uh, recent history, standard practices, and really at this point what I might call anecdotal evidence. Um, you know, we, we really need to test the assumptions that I've come up with on your behalf. In doing so, um, what I felt really needs a, 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 a deeper dive, if you will, before we can really say, all right, we have a, a model that we can feel comfortable using two things stood out. One, we need to come up with a multi-year wage forecast for the city and the schools. You have a you know, large um, staff, personnel is by far um, any of our communities, you know, largest piece of the budget. And so we really want to um, take a look at and, and hopefully utilize your accounting systems that you have to provide um, a, a clearer picture of what your wages and salaries will be, not just for the next year, which we all work so hard to, to come up with each budget cycle, but really what, um, what's trending and what, you know, what are we going to be looking at for that large piece of the budget for the next 
three to five years. Um, by kind of segueing and, and, and doing something with a multi-year f- uh, wage forecast, um, you know, I, I know that the city would find that um, useful as well in your uh, contract negotiations and really trying to understand, you know, what's affordable. We need to sort of see what what's happening and what will happen in in such a big um, part of our budget. The other thing that um, I felt the city should um, consider before saying, you know what, we have a great forecast model, would be um, completing your capital needs assessment for both the city and the schools. By doing that, we're we're coming up with um, a a clear picture of of maintaining what you have and certainly considering what you might need. So once we've done that, um, we can develop a financial strategy, not just for capital, but for these other pieces that we have to consider um, for your financial forecast. So um, completing a building conditions assessment study, um, I think would be very beneficial. Oftentimes your schools will have done that on their own for school buildings because of the programmatic considerations um, changes in enrollment and so forth. So if, if if you have that for the schools, terrific. We certainly should do that um, for the city as well. Rolling stock is another big piece of, of the capital puzzle. And then certainly looking at um, other capital that, that, that maybe doesn't fit into that sort of reoccurring um, ongoing um, cycle for your financial considerations. And then certainly with that, having come up with your building uh, conditions and your rolling stock, um, taking a look at uh, what um, what you might need to make for changes in deferred maintenance. So perhaps some of your operating expenses need to go up in order to extend the life of assets and so forth so that um, you can move those pieces around within five years, 10 years, 20 years, um, so that once that is set, you know, you can certainly make changes as as your capital plans are adjusted and your priorities change, but you need that that framework um, for the next several years to be able to truly understand, you know, what can we we afford for, increases in wages, what might be happening with our, our health benefits long term, and, and those types of questions um, can be answered as well. From that point on, we can adjust one or both sides of the equation. So we can look at your revenues and your expenses to suit the changes in those economic conditions, regulations, and certainly the the changing goals of and for the city of Holyoke. With that, I hope I haven't gone through things too quickly. I really, like I said, just wanted to sort of kick things off tonight. Um, In the coming weeks um, or months, we can help fine tune the workbook that um, the mayor referred to and, and start to build a forecast for the next five years that best meet your needs um, for for the city. So I'm not sure, you know, I'd love to open things up to um, any questions from the group regarding the framework that we've started with um, to help you get started. Um, we certainly can deal with specific questions regarding the, the starting assumptions and the, the baseline scenario that I came up with. Um, really to to start your discussions. Um, For anyone that's actually looked at um, the forecast, um, I guess you could say I, you know, I I used um, the the knowledge that I have picked up um, from the city, as I mentioned, um, what's happening in in recent years, and also what other communities um, the size of Holyoke have been 
you know, contemplating in what they've been dealing with in terms of their forecast models as well, with respect to say payroll, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a starting point. Um, it's not to say that I think it's a, a reasonable um, scenario to start talking about the interconnectivity of, of the different pieces of your budget that we, that I mentioned. Um, so it's a, it's a reasonable starting point, but by no means something that I'm saying um, to you is, is affordable for the city. It's really just a starting point. Andrea, it's a good starting point, and I think we all here appreciate it uh, since we received this document and your introduction and explanation this night uh, certainly is uh, well worth the, uh, the, I think the purpose of this whole thing is to help guide us through the uh, up years, up and coming years. Um, maybe not for discussion this evening, but there are two, er two things in the, in the book that kind of jump out at me. Uh, one, it's always been on my mind is, is it the best scenario to have the wastewater treatment plant as an enterprise fund? Or would it be better off separating it from the uh, ties to the general budget itself? Um, we certainly have uh, our water department and our municipal gas and electric department uh, separated from the direct, you know, as, as far as enterprise funding with the general budget. And I think a number that jumps out, and, and we need a discussion, not again, not this evening, that jumps out in this workbook to me is the uh, school building impact, the projected uh, school building impact, especially fiscal year uh, 28. It's, uh, we, you know, we have a building committee that's, you know, doing the uh, state backwards, uh, well, not backwards, design, you know, design selection process. Uh, at the moment, they're doing a tremendous job, but we haven't set any affordability or any, uh, any bars for, the, uh, for that committee in terms of what the city can uh, afford and uh, certainly what the MSBA is going to uh, reimburse is a big, a big part of that. But th those are the two areas I think future discussion is necessary and, and uh, especially the building, uh, you know, the building, uh, new building itself. It's a, it's a great point. Um, you know, our, your capital needs are, are, you know, very, very important and you are up against, um, you know, some deadlines, you know, if you're going to be, it's, it's very fortunate to be considered part of the um, MSBA program. Um, at the same time, we're, we're uh, held to their um, schedule, and that certainly makes things um, difficult as to when we're going to sort of start and stop and shift, shift our focus. Um, so the, the starting numbers that I put in for capital, um, um, was based on what we thought um, would perhaps be the city's share, um, but again, that's you know that's not a number that you know was set in stone, but really meant there to show you you know if if that's a, a certain amount um, that might be likely, how does that translate into the debt service? When might that start? And then we can start looking at within that five-year window, how can we afford the capital? And in and in that context, really, um, when I look at affordability, um, from my perspective, it's it's not you know trying to set your tax rate and your your goals, but what might be the best way to smooth out, if you will, the increases in the tax levy and build those, um, the new pieces of debt service um, at a time where you're, you're at least sort of, like I said, smoothing things out rather than having, um, you know, those tax increases sort of jump up and, and jump down. It's, it's difficult enough for us to look at what might happen um, with the market values of properties and, and that sort of thing. So as our, you know, tax rate changes, it can be hard for everyone to, um, you know, they're to say, well, you know, why do my, why are my taxes keep increasing? Well, you know, unfortunately our, our budgets go up every year. And so um, there's certainly a lot of moving parts, but hopefully with the workbook that we've come up with, it's something that um, 
is fairly straightforward. You know, we like to be able to show our math, if you will, so that um, different people on the, the finance committee and, and so forth can, you know, perhaps even take copies of that and, you know, perhaps play around with that if you like. But we could also, um, in real time, discuss and show um, changes at the finance committee um, meetings itself um, for most things. So rather than coming up with a, a set of new assumptions, um, you know, here, staff take this and, and come back to us at another meeting, there's actually going to be some progression that we can make in your, your FinCom meetings, certainly um, when you have um, a little more time in your agenda to to discuss. So um, I, I appreciate your, your time and attention. I know you have a a full um, a full schedule tonight, um, but I'd be happy to provide you with um, any information in the in the coming weeks. Thank you, Andrew. I'm just going to open it up for uh, discussion questions. Councilor Councilor Jordan. First of all, I just want to thank uh, the mayor and as well as you um, for putting this together. It's a great conversation. <laughs> and obviously to any of the other department heads that assisted you in this. Um, it's a very uh, timely uh, conversation that we need to have about where we're going. And we need to be looking around the corner always as to what we can project with reasonable level of certainty based on reasonable assess, um, assumptions as to, you know, this is what it looks like. This is our path. And you, in order to have a, a, a path and a plan, uh, you have to have that road mapped. And um, as a family does a budget, Holyoke needs to do a budget. And it can't be a year by year. It really has to be aspirational to a certain extent. And also, um, it has to be concrete. So I did have a few um, questions. Obviously, I look forward to um, you know getting the model and uh, tinkering around with it. But at some point, is it the intent to kind of walk us through each of these sections to say, yeah, this is why I put this for an assumption. You know, um, this is kind of was our logic behind some of these initial numbers or. Was this really back of the envelope? You're just kind of showing us the model, or is this kind of you guys really kick some of these numbers around, and you're kind of thinking this is a pretty s substantial, you know, we kind of think this is our vision of things at this point. Well, certainly, um, I think in the next um, few weeks, I will be spending a great deal of time with uh, the, the mayor and Tanya and the, the other staff members that um, helped pull this information together. So um, what I'd like to do is test the current assumptions with, um, with the staff um, who understand um, certainly, you know, more than, than I do from, um, you know, just working uh, with you folks for the last number of months. So we want to test those assumptions and then I'd like to get a, a sense of what the mayor um, uh, considers affordable from his perspective in, in terms of providing this to you as a, as a starting model. Certainly, um, there will be a lot of conversation going back and forth. I think in terms of, of the information gathered, my understanding of how things work, um, you know, with the city tax rate setting and so forth, the budgeting process been involved in for a number of years. I think we have a good, um, we're at a good point for starting conversation. Um, and I look forward to showing um, the mayor and other folks how um, that model pulls things together. So we can start with the conversation of what I provided. I can explain to you what, um, those assumptions are particularly in the the um, the areas that we talked about. You know, operating expenses versus capital. I've made some assumptions on what I think could be um, affordable 
for the city over the next five years, show how that pulls together, and then see whether or not that's really going to, um, you know, as, as you say, you know, if we kick the tires, perhaps that's not quite what, you know, the city's looking to do. Um, you know, my goal being, um, uh, being conservative, certainly about the increase in the tax levy, but um, more trying to um, moderate the increases and the, the dips and so forth over that forecast period. The most that I can do, um, you know, from my perspective, is smooth things out unless, you know, there's um, something, um, you know, large that sticks out that, you know, is a must, then we can talk about that and explain to folks, you know, why that is, you know, if there was some emergency and that sort of thing. But if we're looking at the next five years, hopefully we have enough knowledge and understanding to, to do the best we can to, um, to tell people what things are looking like, mm -hmm. whether or not at the end of the day, it's, it's what um, is, um, you know, part of the, the, the goal um, for the administration. You know, that's, that's certainly up for, for um, you folks to decide and, and your constituents. But um, I think we have a good basis for those discussions. And, um, you know, I'll be the, I guess we were talking about a wizard earlier tonight. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can so, call me the, the wizard yeah. of Oz, I suppose. So Andrea, for example, there's obviously a lot of moving parts here, but if we were to just take one um, example, and it's obviously this gets a little bit more, um, the, let's put it this way, the crystal ball is much more cloudy the more years you go out. But let's just take sure. property tax levy for next year. If we're at 60 million today, your projection here says that we would go to $64 million uh, in a matter of six months. Start, we would start collecting $64 million tax levy. Um, a 7% tax, uh, 7 percent increase in the levy. Um, what was the thinking behind that being possible? So in terms of the property tax levy, there actually isn't a lot of, um, That's the uh, limit. Guess That's, yeah, just so you know, I'm referring to page three, by the way. Right. So um, you have, um, you know, we have our summary here. And then what I like to do, and, and that's probably going to be one of our first discussions, is looking at the tax levy. How does that go up? What is... Um, the instance of um, excess tax levy capacity and what does that mean to the city and what does the city um, you know expect from that leaving you know quote unquote leaving some of those taxes on the table um, in order to re you know sort of uh, you know put put the line in the in the sand there so calculating what you're property tax levy can go up to the limit is it's you know there's really no guesswork there from that we, we make the calculations we look at what you have um, and you do not have any excluded debt so that actually makes this discussion uh, much simpler um, because excluded debt al allows you to raise taxes over and above that levy limit so really the only um, the only sort of wild car or, or unknown is whether or not the um, city's property levy will uh, change as it's expected. So you have, um, you have a levy limit, which in recent years has been um, adjusted by small amounts and, and in some cases larger amounts because the property market values um, did not change as we might expect. So um, the property tax piece of it is actually, um, it's certainly big numbers and it's important, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's actually one of the easier things that we can um, predict um, with, with great certainty, even, even five years out. 
it's um, you know some of these other pieces of revenue that can be um, more difficult. But again, I think with what we've looked at outside of um, having a discussion on how much free cash you might be generating and how much you might want to use over the next um, five years. Um, I, I think we have a good sense of how much revenue you can expect. The more difficult question then becomes, with that, um, are we going to um, tax to the limit? And if not, um, how does that impact our decisions for our operating expenses for our capital? And I think that's where a lot of the discussion and um, focus will be um, really on the assumptions of um, what your known or you know fixed charges are, contracts and that sort of thing. And that's why I said it would be a, a great um, a great step forward for the city to come up with a strategic capital plan. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I believe that the city is involved in that right now. Um, no, no question that has to involve a, a uh, full study of your buildings, yeah. which you know can cost money, it can take time, but it's, it's really um, a game changer in terms of developing a, a um, strategic capital plan. Okay. Um, Andrea, I'm just staying with the revenue, not the expenditure yep, side. Sure, yep. I, I, I'm just saying the probability of us having a levy of $64 million for FY24 is somewhere between zero and 0.001%. Um, I'm just saying, you know, as you guys do these things, I'm just letting you know that that number is, even if we could tax to that amount, the political will for us to take the levy from what it is today and do dole that out to the people of Holyoke would be, um, you know, mind numbing um, for their wallets. And um, the, the other thing I wanted to just ask you is um, on the state aid cherry sheet, it, did you go mm -hmm. back historically, this assumption says that we're gonna go up $5 million a year, every year um, in, added state aid on the cherry sheet is do we feel like that's likely based on historical um yes and you know for state aid historical is important the trends are important but we do need to look at um you know what's happening now and and look at the components of your state aid you're in a a somewhat unique position where the majority of your state aid is all related to education. So we've been having discussions with the school administration and will continue to do so um, because there are pieces of your state aid that rise and fall based on what's going on with um, education. But in terms of the other pieces of your state aid, yes, we, we you know, I feel comfortable with um, with what we're looking at and what we're projecting over um, the next five years. But certainly, again, you know, this is just starting. So, um, right. you know, we'd go back and we'd look at um, adjusting those based on what the city auditor and others feel um, might be more important. The biggest thing right now for the city to um, consider with respect to revenues next year is the likely drop in ARPA funding. Oh yes, yes. To the we're tune all... of, right, so. A lot. So no matter, <laughs> right, no matter what we're looking at and, and you know, what we might, um, you know, like to do in the next year, that's gonna be the huge, um, the huge elephant in the room. Um, aside from that, um, you know, we feel, again, we feel comfortable with the projections now, as you mentioned, you know, if if the idea is not to, um, you know, aggressively spend up to the levy limit, that that makes total sense. So this is just um, showing you what we could do 
um, or what it would look like using a certain level of um, expenses in the equation. But you're right. So, you know, I feel comfortable with the mechanics here and the, the calculations. It's then going to be up to the city and the council, you know, if, you know, you, you left, um, you know, $2 million of excess levy capacity, you had good reasons certainly to do that. Um, however, in order to um, accomplish um, some of the things that need to be uh, considered over the next, you know, two, three, four years, um, okay. there's going to have to be some more discussion on whether or not um, you're going to tax up to the levy limit or, um, you know, artificially lower that impact, if you will, by using free cash and things of that nature. Okay. Right. I mean, obviously, a lot of moving parts. All I'm saying is you'll probably be privy to a lot more conversations than I will be because this is you and guys are all here with the department heads during the day, and I'm the part-time guy that comes in at, mm -hmm. at night and does his very best. But um, I, I will just say a few things just as guiding principles, my friendly advice. Build in a level of conservatism to all of this. Build, build in margins of safety into some of these numbers. The other thing I would suggest to you is the bottom lines don't all need to equal zero. The fact of the matter, like here, your projections say, it all balances out at the end of the year. Well, guess what? It may not balance out at the end of the year. Give us the bad news if that's what we got. If the bad news is you're minus $2 million in year four, okay. You know what? That means Josh, Kevin, and the rest of the counselors here, we need to go stay to the state or our other people, like later on the agenda. Pilots, state aid, you know, uh, sh we got to shake the tree for more money because this actually would make the case for us to say, you see year three where it says minus four million and year six says minus seven million? You know what? Here, here you go, Governor Haley. This is this is your political subdivision. We're doing everything we can. We need your help here too, right? So um, I would just say, give it to us real. Don't feel a need to, you know, make us feel any more warm and fuzzy than we need to about some of these numbers. And I would be really conservative on some of the revenue numbers. On you know, they, well, yeah, the, I, I, know. I'd say we're we're. We, we, we are and we will continue to be um, conservative with the revenue numbers. The, the, um, the, the piece that will be um, addressed going forward um, with, the, with the mayor's input would be, again, what do you consider affordable? So if we're going to do you know, ABC with our operating expenses, um, this is the page that we're going to be focused on a lot. This is where our conversations will be um, coming to again and again, because this shows you if we say X, this is what's going to happen um, to the increases in the tax levy. Right. So that's, this is everything is really going to be focusing on this page. So it's a matter of, um, folks saying, well, this is what um, we'd like to do with the budget. Once we figure out sort of what those fixed um, programmatic considerations are. Right. And so if we do that, this is what happens to the tax levy. And then, you know, at, at some certain point, of course, we can't raise taxes anymore. So that would be, you know, your, your ending point. So for now, um, what uh, what I've uh, done in terms of the model is, um, you know, I want to show the connection between um, the revenues and expenses. So we're always um, obligated to provide a balanced budget. And certainly when we um, deviate from that, you know, we have discussions in terms of any deficits that might actually occur or um, surpluses which translate off into um, free cash. Um, but we start off with a, a balanced budget, and then we certainly can test the tolerance levels and show you, like you said, the, the worst case scenarios, if you will. 
Right. Um, so we're, we're designed to balance everything out for you and then go from there based on, you know, what your, um, your appetite is um, and, you know, what your needs and, and goals are. The other thing I would point out on the revenue side, again, community preservation is a percentage of the tax levy um, of people's assessment. So if the amount, in order for the levy to be going up, as you're suggesting, means that the property values would have to be going up. If the property values are going up, the CPA would have to be going up. So there's no scenario well, where the CPA could remain flat for five that, years. That's correct. Right. So we haven't. So we've left. We've left the CPA um, to be balanced because we're not having um, that conversation in terms of how might we um, use that those CPA dollars. That's certainly an important part of this. But we're looking at really as it pertains to the the tax levy. So CPA is something that we include in the tax rate setting process. Um, so I've included it here. Um, but again, that would be considered a balanced budget as well. So I don't have any input in terms of what um, might happen to your CPA, but you're, you're correct. Your CPA would go up um, a certain amount, um, but in terms of the model that we're doing here, if that goes up, then your um, your spending would go up just to provide and, and show that that's, that's been balanced as well. Same thing with your enterprise. I don't know um, what is going to happen to, to that program, how the city um, intends to um, increase rates if they've developed um, infrastructure charges and things of that nature. So I have no um, no understanding at this point as to what's going on with that. So we want to include it here so that as we're comparing that to the, to the tax rate setting process, we've not forgotten something. Sure. And so we make sure that those pieces are there. Um, so we certainly, as we go on through this process, if um, the folks that are responsible for those <laughs> programs would like to say, hey, this is what's going to happen, we'll actually put that in. But in terms of the tax levy, this provides, a again, a balanced budget and, and really holds those things um, steady, if you will, mm -hmm. so that we can show you what really is happening to your tax levy, which is what... Um, keeps us all up at night. <laughs> right. Well, again, thank you for getting us going. And I sure. uh, really appreciate the effort and uh, whatever, I'm sure the finance committee, we would be happy to work with you in any way that we can. So thank you all again. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, kudos and thanks to uh, the mayor, Tanya, the auditor, and all the folks that we've met with, uh, the, the treasurer, folks from the... Um, the school admin office were, were um, uh, kind enough to, um, you know, give us their insight on, you know, a starting model. So look forward to working with, with everyone um, to come up with what um, the mayor would like to present and, and, and work with the, the finance committee on. Tanya? Did you have any words of wisdom for us? <laughs> Actually, I really, this makes me happy. So not a lot of things to. Yeah. Those are words of wisdom. It was a lot of it was a lot a lot of work and a lot of input and all information that I feel like we already had, but she took it and put it put it like in a beautiful format, and you can just see you know how things are growing, and I like it. I think I think her. I don't know, Mayor. All these finance people talk, uh, you know, in terms of uh, aesthetic and. And the beauty of, of numbers. It is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I admit. <laughs> and, 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 beauty yeah. is in the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Andrea, thank you on behalf of all of us. We appreciate it. Um, thank is there you. Any, appreciate the time. Any further discussion? The chair would entertain or suggest that we take item number 10, report it was complied with, therefore we can tell the city council that we had this uh, wonderful introduction meeting. Mm -hmm and keep the workbook in committee for future reference okay. and maybe a future discussion as 
And Andrea, Andrea pointed out. So you're suggesting table nine? Table, table nine, archive. Okay. And, and uh, 10 is uh, complied with. 10 is complied with. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Motion to take uh, item 11 off the Next table. Second. Motion made a second to take item 11 off the table. <clears throat> this is uh, introduced uh, by Councillor Jordan. That the auditor provide the city council with a financial summary of how much revenue is generated by each department, not counting tax revenue, fiscal 2021 broken down by grant revenue, other revenue, and please exclude the sewer department, water department, and GE user fees. Goal is to understand how much revenue by department is being generated to and being generated excluding exclude, excuse me, excluding tax revenue. Off the table, all those in favor? Any aye, opposed? Aye. So moved. Let me just... uh, maker of the order and our auditor are both here. Super. So um, I don't know if this has had an opportunity. I know the auditor has a million things that I'm sure she's working on. Um, and it's not dire pressing, but it would be greatly appreciated because what I'm trying to capture here, uh, Tanya, is how much revenue is the department's generating you know we hear things like this evening i learned that we're you know leasing fire stations to companies and somebody's given 500 a month and this one's 1500 a month and you know all these other type of revenues uh building department the building commissioner the former building commissioner was in here at one time and he'll say oh yeah and on the permits you know we charge all this for permits and we get this this and this and i'd like to really kind of dive into how much revenue um, these departments are all generating um, and really get our arms around that um, so I can understand that better. Um, and, and for example, the police department has revenue that they're generating from doing road jobs and stuff, different private contractors and things. So something we don't really look at or think about, we know it's there, but to actually sort of see it over two fiscal years of saying, Okay, the Parks Department rented out fields. They generated X on that. Like, we never get that kind of a breakdown. And uh, that would be helpful if that's something, you know, you could think about putting together for us. So I think I sent this in an email, but I actually tried to put it in a little better of a format, and I did provide copies for everybody okay. to Councillor McGivern. And what it is is like this is the information that we use, you know, to create the sheet um, that Andrea created. So what it has on it for you is it has all oh, of the revenue. But if you, you know, you, if you look down, yeah. it says departmental revenue. But I didn't want to just give you the departmental <clears throat> revenue because things like rentals and other things weren't included in that. So what I gave you is everything. Sure. And if you'd like me to manipulate it, I can manipulate it and add it all up by department. I just kind of need to know what you need. Okay. And at the very end, the last page is all of the grant revenue that you requested. And I did totals. Because if I did not do the totals, it would have been a million pages of all the different grants. But I can. I can break it out by grants. I can break it out by anything you want, probably. But that's a starting point for you. And if you want to just take a look at this at your leisure and let me know if you want anything manipulated or if you want more information, I can I can go ahead and just give that to you. It's all there. So it's pretty easy. Oh, great. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much. And um, any of the ones that are attributable to a specific department, it has their name on it? Yeah, you... If you go down the list, you'll see like rental, city hall, auditorium, rental, okay. library, lease. But if you keep going, it goes mm -hmm. and it has a section that's just departmental revenues. And these are all separated out onto the way that they're reported on your tax recap. Okay. So all different numbers mean all different things, if that makes sense. Like yep. 700 is a other department revenue. Right. If you go right. down, you you can see, all, you know, all the different types of revenue revenues. I didn't add them up by department, but that's something I can do. I just have to manipulate the sheet a little bit. Yeah, no, that, um, yeah, let me, let me work with this. So it looks like in a given year, 
non-school department is about just under 14 million in the course of a year then? Or is it, oh, that, oh no, that was 2022 year to date. So um, let's see, fiscal year 21 was 100 and, does this tally out to $155 million? Is that right? Or These are, that's all? I don't know what page you're on. Uh, I'm looking at the basically the last two pages yeah. of the report that you produced. So that's all. That's all of these revenues. So this is a spreadsheet, and this is all of the revenues okay. added okay. all together. Oh. Okay. So that's not just departmental revenue. That's including all of your revenue, including your your uh, cherry sheet. Oh, and obviously we have like for example uh, a topic we're going to talk about in a little bit. You know, looks like like 1.6 million or so is what we're getting from pilots would be an example of that. Right, and then if you look at your tax recap form, there's a section for the pilot, and you're going to see that estimate is okay. based on these actual figures. Oh, fantastic. All right, well, thank you. You've mm -hmm. given me some more homework to go through all this. You're welcome. Um, great. Thank you so much. And obviously, you know, one of the things... We, I'd like to just show too is some of these departments are they really generating more money coming into them than maybe we're spending or what's really the true cost of some of these departments how sustainable are them are they and um, then the question is to the extent we can have it looked at is maybe are our department heads having conversation? I would turn this question over to the mayor. At least my thinking, if I was in your sort of shoes, would be department head, you're you've got you're spending five hundred thousand. I'm just giving this as a hypothetical, and you're raising three hundred thousand. Is that for the amount of permits, like metrics? See, one of the things, like if you're in business, they would say, you know, what are your volumes? Like you sold X number of something. Like in our case, do we have, sometimes I've seen reports that say, you know, I produced this number of permits and I, we generated this much revenue. Then you could do it and compare those type of statistics to the Springfield Building Department or the Chickabee Building Department and sort of get, well, how many permits does Springfield generate and how much do they get? Oh, wow, well, they're doing 10% more permits, but they're generating 20% more revenue. So does that mean, to, does that tell legislators here that, hey, my fees aren't high enough? You know, maybe that's the conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, is it, you know, hey, on benchmark, we're doing better than most. Um, you know, for our size, are we getting about as much road job revenue as another city? Is this an opportunity for new revenue? for us. So I just wanted us to kind of think about, you know, what we are generating non-tax revenue in these departments and then kind of think it through to see how can we benchmark this versus other communities to see if we're low or high and if there's opportunities there and are we leaving money on the table, um, I guess would be the, the conclusion. And the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting and in speaking to Damien when he came at one of the meetings, he said, um, mm -hmm. Hey, you know, um, I want to provide, I think we, the request was something in the order of we needed $50,000 or something like this for maybe not even that much, I think it was maybe $10,000 uh, for bringing in outside services to help him to stay on top of all the permits and things. But then when you look and you start getting into that and you say to him, well, how much revenue is generated by that 10,000 of us paying that service, it was like 50,000. Mm. So it, it was like, well, this becomes a no-brainer, right? Right. If we can stay on top of that, maybe the answer is, maybe it's cheaper to really pump out the, the these permits and stay on top of it. It might be cheaper to have a service versus an employee, or it might be, you know, it's don't get behind on this because we're actually losing money by getting behind on these permits that we're not saving, you're actually losing, right? Because we could be, uh, if we had opportunity to do more inspections, like we don't have the resources, so we don't do more inspections. But if we did more inspections, we would get more revenue. It's sort of one of these type of scenarios and it's just trying to get some statistics and things um, in this area for us to just kind of think about, so. Uh, really appreciate Tanya uh, how quickly you put that together so uh, um, 
I guess basically it's been complied with, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Yep. Any further discussion? Motion on the floor then is that this order has been complied with. Yes. All those in favor? Thank you Aye. so much. Opposed? So moved. Thank you, Tanya. Jeff, I think it's already done, but we make sure that all city councilors have uh, electronic access to these numbers, and we'll report it out next Tuesday, and I, I think it'll take care of itself, but thank you. Motion to take um, item number 12 off the table. Second. Motion and second to take item number 12 off the table. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? This has been in committee for a while, and it kind of dates back, but Two I might years. go hand in hand with this year, too. I'm not sure. Councillor Bacon, who was with us, introduced this that the auditor review accounts to find any available funds and departments that are available for transfer to the DPW for snow removal. Uh, this goes back to uh, February of 2021. Mm -hmm. I apologize mm -hmm. to Councillor Bacon because I think we kind of did some things, but this just got uh, lost in the, uh, in the shuffle, shuffle, but I wanted to bring it out. I understand that we're okay this year because it just hasn't snowed. Yeah, no, but, uh, that helps. Uh, there is expenses because <laughs> ice is sometimes more expensive. <laughs> That's true. Ice is That's more true. expensive sometimes than snow itself. It but is. off the table for discussion, Councillor Bacon and the auditor, any input? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I thought you would just be cleaning out this out of the jacket. Yeah. And I believe at the time that I filed it, we were trying to resolve certain debts by finding extra money in various departments, and I believe that's why I filed that at the time. I, I think you're absolutely correct, and I think it was done. We just never really acted on this. Right. So I guess we could call it complied with. Right. Thank you. Motion in item number 12 is complied with. Motion made second item 12 is complied with, unless the auditor tells us there's a deficit and she's looking for money. I'm always looking for money, but there's not <laughs> a deficit. Well said. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Motion to take item number 13 off the table. Motion made a second to take item 13 off the table for discussion. Uh, introduced by Councilor Bartley and Councilor Dordain that the order to provide an update on the pilot uh, program. And please provide the names and parties with the city has a pilot agreement with the amounts paid status of payments from the past one year period uh, regarding the payment also whether payments are I'm sorry regarding whether payments are current and please submit to the city council by the second meeting in january uh the auditor is with us we do have uh, her her copies of her submission of the uh the pilot programs before we start if i could councillor bartley gave me a call before the meeting i know he was here earlier knowing that he was not going to be able to uh to stay he wants to be part of this discussion he's asked um that we table it um even if we do have a preliminary discussion which okay. I think is uh, appropriate but that we table it so that his thoughts and input could be shared with perhaps our thoughts and inputs and of course the uh the auditor and the mayor you know what the future thoughts and inputs are on pilots uh there hasn't been a comprehensive look at pilot and pilot payments, I think, in some time now. And I thank both the uh, makers of the order for filing this because it's uh, an important part of revenue for uh, stream that we don't get unless we ask for it. Pilots are voluntary. Voluntary? Voluntary. Yeah, it's like, voluntary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what time is it? <laughs> voluntary. So with that in mind, um, the, what, what would the uh, wishes be of the committee? Just a brief oh, and I, I apologize. I did um, let uh, the assessor know that we probably would not be having a full discussion on okay. this as to keep her here for the whole night. It made no sense. Understood. All right. Just briefly? Yep. Okay. First of all, I would say at this point, um, unless the, the chairman wants to use 13 maybe as the vehicle, um, to, to have a discussion, I think 14 has just been complied with. Yeah. Um, but as far as by way of uh, briefly, I had iterated some of these um, numbers at the last time we spoke. Um, first, thank you to the auditor for providing this. But basically, you know, as I had alluded to at the last meeting, I think I talked about a couple of these, like ISO New England. You know, mm -hmm. I went back and reviewed some of the parcels 
regular property tax, um, if they were paying regular property tax, their bill would be $626,000. They currently pay a pilot of $140,000, so they're getting a 78% tax break. Um, Mass Green High Performance Computing Center. Um, they ha would have, under normal circumstance, a regular property tax bill of 210000 They currently pay a pilot of 80000 so they're receiving a 62% tax break. Hoyoke Housing Authority owns 66 properties valued at $34 million. Their regular um, residential tax rate would be 652000 a year. Their current pilot is $16,000 per year. They're receiving a 97% tax break. So, um, you know, we've got these all over the city of, these are the ones that we have pilots for. Yeah. Now we've got how many we don't have no pilot don't for. Have so the question is, and I know the mayor is, is working hard to begin these conversations to just say to some folks, like an ISO New England, who's a pretty successful company, hey, you know, you're doing pretty good here. Can you help us out? Look at our situation. If we could pick up another million or $2 million across all these properties, um, the housing authority, can they build that into some of the grants that, you know, think of how many residents live in public housing, like myself from the, old, the good old days. Um, you know, we go to the schools, we need police, we need fire, we need trash pickup, we need all these things. And gee whiz, we got to pay those. And so the housing authority, if they're getting grants from Washington or Boston or whatever, can they build a little something in to say, hey, we got these municipal fees, we have these administrative expenses, um, we, we need to get some of these resources. So um, by revisiting a lot of these, I think we have an opportunity here. You know, you pick up a couple hundred grand here and a couple hundred grand here and, and you go through some of these, you're gonna, you might turn into some real money. And um, it's the type of conversations we need to have in light of our circumstances. So um, as far as the whole piece of it being, everybody gives out of the kindness of their heart, like the mayor, he can go in and say, gee, you know, pretty pleased with sugar on top, will you give us some more money? Um, this is what your tax bill would be, and you're currently only giving us this, perhaps you're giving us nothing. I have suggested to some of the local elected leadership who um, you know, is very attentive to listening to our needs, and um, we had a very good meeting the other day, in fact, and this is one of the topics that came up, um, to say, if you're over a certain threshold, the legislature and regulators at the state level are gonna to need to consider, like for example, if you're valued at where you would have, uh, say, over a million dollars, at some point, you know, especially non-religious where you're profitable or, you know, you're doing well, you're getting grants and you're getting real money by every semblance, you're a healthy organization, there's got to be something that you have to pay some minimum amount of tax um, to contribute to the community. Otherwise, um, it's really going to be disadvantageous. We're not talking about little nonprofits who barely have enough money to scrape by or religious institutions or something. That's all been traditionally exempt, should remain that. But there should be a little something here that they can make it, even if it's not compulsory, that there's a guideline, a suggested amount. And then the state needs to consider in the funding formula for the city that if you're a city like us who is receptive to organizations that help the needy. Why? Because we're a community of needy, right? So naturally, people want to come here. But the, the circular down effect of that is the poorer you are, the more likely you are to get um, nonprofit organizations into your community. And as a result of having more nonprofits, they purchase things that perhaps space that used to be taxed and now is not taxed. And therefore, the tax base erodes even more. And so now we have even less money to help the people of the community. And it's no, not through any anybody's fault, it's just that's the tax system. The state legislature needs to recognize that, to say, okay, if you go over a certain amount of exempt property, 
that needs to be built into the formula so that we're picking that up in local aid that says, hey, Holyoke, you stepped up to the plate when Wilbraham didn't, right? And you're willing to take nonprofits into your community. So based on this formula, and this is how much tax revenue you lost because of it, well, in the formula, we count 50% of that. And we're going to give you, say you would have been normally entitled to $4 million, we'll give you $2 million. They've got to consider this in the way poorer communities, particularly the gateway cities, because this is really a, an issue. You know, like, for example, you know, I, I think I've mentioned some of these before, but like the medical office building across from Providence Hospital now got taken over by ServiceNet. The former owner used to pay. Now we lost a hundred and something thousand <clears throat> dollars in tax revenue on that building. Um, HCC, God bless them. But they take Grin and Barrett, make it the nursing school. We lose $82,000 at that corner of, of money that we used to get. Um, it's, it's, you know, Girls Inc. That was a law office with a bunch of things. They go in there, great organization, but we lose $35,000 when that comes off the tax rolls. Somewhere, some way, that's got to be some combination of the mayor doing the best he can to go around and say, hey, can you help us out? But someone in Boston's got to consider that and how Holyoke and the Lawrences and the Fall Rivers and, and the Springfields get funded. So um, kind of trying to raise some awareness on and, it. And never mind uh, Holyoke Medical taking house after thank house you. for a parking lot. That's a great. Instead of building a parking deck, they state taking Wang Laboratories exactly. and making it into their lab and 100 vehicles parked in that parking lot we can't get one dollar of excise tax. Excise tax. Yeah. yeah I, thank you for bringing that up. You were a hundred percent right. The, you know, I have watched, and I know Juan's here, the Ward Six counselor. Um, you're watching all these buildings being taken over over there, and Holyoke Medical, you know, a noble organization that we love having here. But at the same time, you know, they took down a beautiful two-family home on on Beach Street, a big one, which I happen to know who the former owner was, and she had the whole building rented out. You know, it sold, and now that used to pay taxes. The building is totally gone. They demolished it to the ground. Um, you know, it, it's that type of stuff. They're purchasing the homes up, go, uh, these buildings as you're going up uh, Courser Street. All of that is coming off the tax rolls. That hurts the bottom line here. Um, I use the example of Sears Automotive. Sears was paying us taxes. The Plumbers Union bought it. Again, a great organization, but they got it classified as a school, so now that building doesn't pay any more taxes anymore. So, you know, this type of stuff, we've got bills here to pay, as everybody knows. And, you know, they're using the streets. They're using police and fire, so there you Not go. Nobody said Yale Street. <laughs> there's a lot of those too. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that too. We, we're oversaturated, but I, I do agree with your thought, Councillor Jardine, that um, we we take uh, item 14 complied with. Yep. Let the yeah. whole city council know that the auditor, you know, answered uh, the request, and then we just table 13 for a future discussion. Yep. With the assessor and everybody. table 13. Table 13 complied 14. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Motion take item number 15 off the Motion table. Motion second to take item 15 off the table for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? This is the annual PERAC report that we received. Uh, it's a copy that goes to the Holyoke Retirement Board from uh, John Parsons, the executive director of PERAC. It's the appropriation fiscal, for, you know, projection for fiscal uh, 2024. We did receive it at our last city council meeting. I put it out. I talked to Tony today. Is uh, Tony still with us? And I apologize. I put it on the agenda. Rory's here. Kind of. Rory is with us, but um, oh. I put it on the agenda for a couple purposes. Uh, one, uh, the impact on you know expenses, you know future expenses coming up. Uh, Tony did drop off some information for us. For us, I don't think tonight's a great night to have this discussion because it's getting a little bit late. But I think it's an important discussion that we should have in the near future in terms of uh, projection. So. Where are you? Right, here he is. I am here. Tony, I'm, I'm sorry. On, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know when we talked earlier today, I thought we'd get to this a lot quicker. But would you like to wait? Before I, I was taking too much thunder from you. But you want to weigh in on some of the uh, 
information here and what your thoughts are oh, as to I mean, what we can do? Yeah, this is just um, this is just the annual appropriations list, and what this is is uh, payments from the city, gas and electric, waterworks, um, geriatric. You know, no longer with us, so that's a good thing. Wastewater and housing authority. Um, they all pay their own. The city portion is about twelve million six out of the eighteen million. Um, besides the member um, deductions, the member deductions are about six point four five million that come out of everyone's paycheck that goes towards the um, retirement. Um, our payroll each month is between you know 2.3 and 2.5 million a month. So add those two numbers up, that comes out just about what we uh, we uh, spend on payroll for retirees for um, each year. Tony, what about our unfunded liability and our our extra payments and how we're doing there? Yeah, that that. We um, we had a good actuary report for this year. We dropped down seven percent. We also shaved two years off of our un, you know our funding schedule. So from uh, it was two thirty six, we're back down to two or two thirty two thousand and thirty five. We're back to two thousand and thirty three. So when the market good for us and we've done very good over the past you know couple of years we've uh, we've had you know it shows in our actuarial report so, so 2000 good thing. 2034 2033. we're looking to be uh, fully funded with uh, the trends 2033 would be fully funded wow yeah it's pretty good we've been doing good and we're at about 70 75 percent funded right now as we speak so the fund has done very well over the past you know uh, five years but a lot of funds have done very good this year wasn't a great year but stacked against our peers i think our our, our fund has done actually very well over uh, against our peers you know throughout the state so I mean, We're going forward just, and everything's, uh, everything's on schedule. Appreciate that. Just uh, understanding what the market's gone through, that, those are some, some good projections. Yeah, I mean, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a great year for, for a, a lot of uh, retirement boards for uh, Massachusetts. So most of um, our 10 to 14 percent, we were just under 10 percent for the year, which is very good, you know, in the peer group. You know, so we're proud of that, and we, you know, we hang our hat when times are tough. You know, you gotta you gotta wade the waters when times are tough, and we had a, you know, we had a, you know, not a great year, but you know, you you, you have to, you know, take the good with the bad for, you know, with the market. Any discussion? I have a few questions. Councilor Jordan. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, Tony, did did you get that email I sent you? Uh, since we're on the topic of yeah, the... I, I did reply to it again. Oh, I'm not getting it, so I I, I may have to come over did and just get a copy because it's it's not coming. Yeah, through. I mean, I can I can drop it off, Kevin, too, anytime. So. Okay. Hey, um, and you know what? Check your spam because sometimes my stuff goes to spam because we we're like a real. Our emails are really, really uh, okay. like safe, safe stuff. So check your spam. Every, everything right. I get from Jenny like goes to my junk mail. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> no, I, I'll check no. there, and then uh, if worse comes to worse, you and I if will connect. That, if not, give me a, you, you know, you got my cell number. So you oh, yeah. Text me, and I'll, I'll bring that report for you. Oh, you're the best. I appreciate it. So uh, I'll try not to ask you too many hard questions in light of that. But I do have uh, just a couple here. I happen to read yep. um, the retirement board's uh, reports that are sent to PARAC. And I wanted to ask you, the first one was, um, the, according to the funding report that was submitted for December 31st, 2021, it said that we had a fund balance of $408 million in our account. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I looked at the report you gave me the other day that was through the end of December, and it said right. that our balance was three hundred and fifty-five million. So it looks. Is it, it, am I reading that right? That we lost fifty-three million dollars last year. Um, probably less than that because we have cash also, but probably on the like the forty million side. So. Okay. So there's an besides that Siegel report that you right. gave me a copy of at the retirement board meeting the other day. Is there a there's another like cash account that has X amount in it too? Yeah, we have so much money in cash. Right now we have about eleven to twelve million in cash. Okay. And that's because we've had some influx of uh, funds that have paid off. So Okay. You know, we have a full. We probably have to go out to bid for some other products, just to, you know, because you don't want to have too much cash. But like this year, sure. the cash kind of helped because you weren't losing money on it. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yep. Um. Yeah. I read the um, what we reported to the state is that we're on a seven point two five percent annual growth rate, and I was very pleased to see that our seven year and our 10 year is north of that. So that's great right. um, that yep. we we were at about 8.7 to 8.8%. So that means that's a good sign that we're hitting our 7.25 target. So that's appreciated. Right. I yep. wanted to ask um, you, go ahead. I'm sorry, Tony, were you going to say something? No, 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 go ahead. I mean, yeah. um, I can send the board the new uh, funding schedule too. Okay. So. I can give you that. I mean, they dropped it down to 7% return assumption okay. for unfunded liability, and that's for, you know, fully funded by June, June 30th, 2033. Just because the market was so bad, they dropped it. We dropped to 7%. So. Okay. Are we still on a requirement of 2035, or do you think that's going to go to 2040? No, it went to 2033. I just said that. No, no, no. I, that's what you think ours will be. But the, isn't there a requirement that it be definitely done by 2035? I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to get that answer. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about being done by 2035, but... We were before 2035. We shaved two years off of that with the past couple of years. Okay. Maybe you could take a look at a that. Couple, but had, Yeah. I think uh, there's a requirement that it be the, done by 2035, though. But, okay. Yeah, I, 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 I can check that for you, too. All right. The other, the other question I wanted to ask you about, and it's going to take a conversation that we're going to have to think about, but... Under the current formula, it says that we're supposed to increase the budget annually for the retirement board by $375,000 a year. That's what it said on the state report. And mm -hmm. my question is, like, in a couple, <laughs> in a couple of years, like, how, do, how does that work? Like, when we think about how much we're getting, bringing in maybe an extra million a year, are we really in a position to grow this like exponentially 375 on top of 375 on top of 375 like i'm just wondering is that do you, does do you uh, feel well, comfortable you know, yeah uh you know depending on the year you know depending on what we have and you know what i submit back to the state you know the fair act I submit a, a, a form which shows salaries for each year and, you know, employees for each year. So those are sent to me from September to September. I submit them to the state and they come back with a schedule, you know. So, I mean, if salaries actually went down a year, then things would get changed. But in these days, you know, you have contracts, you have you know, contracts that have to be met, and then you have increases for salaries each year. So, I mean, as long as you're going to have increases for salaries, I don't see that, you know, the 375 changing, you know. Right. No, I agree. That's that's yeah. why I'm, yeah. I'm concerned that we don't have it to give you. That's, that's not that that's not going to be what's no, required. I mean, yeah. 
That, that's okay, going to get I, tight. I was on the other side also. You know, I, I was in the assessor's office. I'm yeah. well aware that, you know, the city, you know, scrapes and claws for everything it has, you know. Yeah. I just want people here to be aware that the requirement is this keeps getting bigger by 375000 each year. So, okay. Hey, uh, Tony, I'll I'll catch up with you and I'll, I'll go through yeah, the other stuff. Yeah, tomorrow and I can, meet you in, I can meet you anywhere, Kevin, to get that to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Any further discussion? No. Nope. Is this something we just want to keep in the archives? There's no vote that we have to take. No. It's just information yeah. we received. Yeah. Okay. I mean, during the budget time, we have a vote. But, yeah, right, right. <coughs> motion right. to receive. Motion that we uh, received, and we're going to keep it in the archives yeah. for uh, future yeah. reference. And if there's any, any literature or anything you need from me, you know, just let me know, and I can reach out and, and get it to you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Tony. And Thank the you. is a lot later than we discussed, but I appreciate you being here. Well, you know what? This seems like old times when I was the assessor. Motion to take item number 16 off the table. Motion to take guys. item 16 off the table for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Introduced by Councilor Pello that the request be made to the Mayor's Office to provide the current list of business businesses that received ARPA funding through the city business grant and each dollar amount awarded to include rejected applicants. Um, discussion to the maker of the order. Will, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I just want to thank everybody that worked on this and everybody that uh, that worked on getting the money out to people. This order came from a couple businesses down in Ward 2 that were requesting how to be a part of the process and how to see if they could get some funds. And uh, I'm pretty happy that they made the list at the end of the cut. So thank you to the mayor again, and thanks to everybody. I do just have one complaint, and it's going to sound a little critical, because I know we have money coming up now for the ARPA hearings and, and everything else. And Aaron was in here uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about grant money. I know he mentioned High Street as an example, that uh, the businesses on High Street could apply to it. And, and the complaint is more so about you know general grants. Um, Paper City Clothing is on here, and, and I think they got like something around ten thousand something dollars. And I think on the electronic sheet, it said that they were getting that for renovations to the building that they're at, the rental that they're at now. And I mean, just just a big quick brief on 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 them. I mean, we gave them a property for it was it was a pretty cheap property that we gave them something like five grand. And then a couple weeks go by, and they come into City Council, and then they tell us that they have all the money ready to invest into the property that they're going to redevelop. And then a couple months go by after that, and somehow they get a 260 something thousand dollar grant. And a couple months go by after that, they get a $20,000 grant, and then I think they ended up getting a donation for another 20, so that was a 300 grand that they needed to renovate. So, I mean, I, I think that moving forward, I just hope that we're keeping in mind when, when we're doling out money, and I, they didn't do anything wrong, um, but I just think maybe we could do a better job at making sure that other people are, are getting funds like that. I mean, $300,000 when you think about it, a business that's pretty much just pumping out a bunch of t-shirts. And by the way, those t-shirts are also paid for by grants. So, I mean, I, I think we got to, you know, make sure that we're, that we're managing, managing that properly. Thank you. But that was my only complaint other than that. I appreciated that the businesses that requested the award to, to, to get special attention got it. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. <laughs> Mayor, oh, sorry, Jordan, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Just real quick question, Mayor, is we give them the money, they do the work. Is there follow up with them to make sure they did whatever they were supposed to do with the money? Or, and for example, if they're even still in business. See, one of the things I'm concerned about is, did we maybe give somebody $25,000 and they're not in business anymore, just as a for example. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, is, is that a good use? Like, or is there a clause in the contract that says, hey, I get your money, and then I go bye-bye Holyoke, and do they have to give us the money back? You know, there's that, is there any accountability around that? So th this is, it's really Alicia's wheelhouse and how, okay. how it's managed, but I can say the funds were for, and, and this was, I think, even before all of us uh, got here, because this was like the start of the pandemic. Of course, yeah. 800,000 yeah. was, was uh, distributed. Alicia had a very uh, strong process for that, how that got dished out and how they assessed businesses and determined need. And it's for those businesses that were able to 
existing businesses at that time that were open before COVID and then were impacted that were able to prove that there was a, a, a an actual impact because of COVID. COVID. So whether if they decide to close a year later or what, like if you prove that there was an impact and you I couldn't see. make payroll yeah. Yeah. or you couldn't make, yeah, that that's where the fund covers. So it, it, it doesn't, you know, I don't think we can put, I mean, it's American Rescue Plan funds. It's not, I see. you know, it offers, a, there's not like a specific requirement that you had to stick around. As far as this particular shadow, without knowing too much, um, and I'm sure if Alicia was here, she'd be able to tell you, here's what happened, here's what's going on, here's how we, so, you know, she's really good at, at, at that. Um, uh, but they were down at, before they bought this building, they were down at, what's the street over here? They, they were down off of Ray Street. Ray, yeah. That's where the Paper City Clothing Company was. And they were an active business. So my guess is that they were able to prove that there was an impact because of COVID before they even considered to go after this this building. And that's how they got that ten grand. Not connecting with Alicia and, and learning more about that. <laughs> as far as other resources, they're able to leverage. I mean, you know, there's um, a lot of state resources available to uh, from the mass development that um, uh, and other programs like that from the state that offers opportunities for small small business growth. I don't. It's Aaron's wheelhouse. He knows much more about that. Um, how that works in that world but uh that's that's my guess and how you know as far as getting money you're absolutely i think one thing for sure and we have certainly learned the first round especially as we get ready for the second round um and if we're going to contribute um another tranche to small business support we have to you know, yeah we can all we got to do good at finding those businesses that don't know anything about this um, and that's where, like, the Chamber has been very helpful. e for all has been very helpful. And also you got the Latino Economic Development Corporation, our friend Andrew Melendez, who's been doing his thing, and that's been very helpful in identifying those businesses and, and, and making sure that they take advantage of these opportunities as they appear. So we could do – we could, and, and Alicia does what she can to get the word out. I do what I can to get the word out. I think you all help get the word out. And as we go forward with this next tranche, assuming we continue to support small businesses with, with ARPA, we want to be sure that it's a all hands on deck, getting the word out to every business um, that, that qualify to be sure that 100% of our business folks in town get an opportunity to apply for these funds and take advantage of them for sure. Tanya? I just actually wanted to speak on the accountability piece of it. So when they do come in to receive their ARPA funds, they do sign an agreement that that states, you know, how much money they're going to have and how they're going to be spending it. Do they need help with payroll? Do they need help with bills? And they submit the invoices to us. If they can pay them up front, they pay them up front and we reimburse it. If they can't, that's written in their agreement. And then we actually pay the invoices for them so they can continue you know, with their business. Okay. I also want to say about accountability is that we asked for a lot of documentation to show that COVID impacted these businesses, but mm. the smaller businesses have a really hard time gathering the information yeah, big one. to show the impact. So I know that that's something that Alicia and her team are also working on. Mm. To, to that point, Alicia does a fantastic job with process and make an ensuring sometimes maybe even more than what we should be or need to um but at the end of the day you know she's in case we get audited later or the federal government comes knocking on door and starts asking questions any business there you have any there's she's got document caseloads of documentation of everything they looked at reviewed approved denied um, the business is going to apply for up to twenty. We weren't giving everybody twenty five thousand. Up to twenty five, <laughs> if you were able to prove to what um, our auditor was just, you can show documentation of that hardship, and they gave what you lost. They didn't just give you extra. Right. Um, so she, you know, I, I got to say, it's one thing for sure. Alicia does that. That department does an incredible job in 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 managing it to that extent. Um, but you know, obviously, they're learning. Um, uh, they had to 
build it on the fly, mm. not with no real guidance um, through the final rule on it, except what we think might be eligible. Um, uh, but now that we're getting ready again for this second round, assuming again we support, you know, there's a lot of like tweaks that they're working on, such as what the auditor alluded to. We learned that small businesses really don't have the in-house capacity to really keep track of that stuff to mm -hmm. the extent as we would expect with larger corporations. Um, uh, so, it, it, you know, a little bit more technical support on that front, a little more time or whatever the case, flexibility, be it however we want to describe it, will help in that process in the future. But those are some of the internal discussions she's already having. So, Quick, quick question, <clears throat> Mayor. Is this an allocation that was in your discretion? Like you said, okay, I've got, and there was a big, like $9 million, $10 million, whatever that number was for the first round that – Basically, I'm going to give $250,000 a sign for small business relief. And I'm going to give, or did this, did ARPA require, no, 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 you must give mm -hmm. like this amount to this. It was that, so um, remember, so when ARPA became available, again, there was no real guidance on how to disseminate it. And there were a lot of questions to even what was eligible, what wasn't what was eligible. So, you know, Alicia, being how she is, did a lot of reading, a lot of researching, a lot of connecting with colleagues. And they all they did really was mirror the CDBG process. Okay. And so um, with, you know, she brought in the Citizens Advisory Committee. There was a city council. There was, you know, the mayor had the fine, similar right. format. Um, and uh, the list of... Uh, priorities that came up that were essentially supported for our pro support eight hundred thousand dollars was on that list for small businesses support and it went through that process and was supported with I see. um and as they go forward with their i don't know call it an assessment uh intake format or whatever the case with these businesses they would identify and then form written agreements between the business owner in the city of Hoyoke, or even the, the if it's a nonprofit or whoever is receiving the funds, if it's a department head um, for a particular project or whatever the case, there there's a MOU of some kind that's um, that signed. And so, you know, the mayor signs the MOU, yeah. and Alicia goes forward with um, uh, you know giving the funds. Something to consider. If this is totally discretionary under the mayor's purview, it would seem to me if we're going to give money to small businesses, which is certainly noble, um, obviously plenty of families lost their jobs. They're not getting that kind of, op I can't come down, you know, not me personally, but a citizen couldn't come down and say, hey, you know, I lost my job. Can I get a check for five grand so I can, you know, pay my bills? It can't be private that way understood but the point is i think taxpayers when we're thinking about allocating money to small businesses we got to be pretty tight about what it is we're giving them this right this is to keep them going because to lose small business is a real harm to the mm -hmm. community and i guess my concern is if we give you money and you just end up folding up anyways it seems to me to be self-defeating of a program. Like the goal was we receive these monies and whatever in your discretion decided, you know what, or um, former Mayor Murphy said, you know what, I just feel like, you know, we should give this 800,000 because these businesses are really hurting. We can't lose these people in Holyoke, right? So then it just seems to me that there should be some criteria that says, look, we're willing to give this because you're sticking it out and we want you to be here and you got to stick around for, I don't know, three years, three years, years, five years, whatever that number is. But if you say, Oh, thanks for the 25 grand, by the way, here's my closed forever sign that goes out in the window. How has that helped Holyoke? And now we've taken 25 grand that could have went to fix a sewer pipe or Lord knows what of all the other things that we need to do around here. And I'm just saying, like, we might want to think about that in the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I'll talk to Alicia and find, but just remember that it, it wasn't 
X amount for folks to go and buy a brand new whatever it was to cover loss revenue. So it was to cover payroll um, if they're renting. From oh, no the doubt. All legitimate. hundred percent. But I'm only saying is like if they're wrapping up as a business anyways. Okay. Say they lost a hundred grand and they're folding. Okay. That was the business decision to fold. And we now just write them a check throwing it out the door so that instead of losing a hundred grand, they lost 75 and the company dissolves anyways. They're, they have a legal entity. They're probably telling all their creditors, have a nice day because I'm an LLC or an Inc anyways. So why is that in the public interest of Holyoke to give somebody a check that Lord only knows where it goes, right? When they fold the business up anyways. The, the public interest is we want to save businesses. That's the whole public interest here. And if we're not saving businesses, it seems like it's a windfall on the way out the door. I think the other, did you make a comment that we pay directly the, if they show a receipt or something? Yeah, with, with some of them, depending on their agreement and what their needs are, like say that they need help with their rent, they have to prove that they're still in business, that they have to pay rent, who they pay it to. You know, there is criteria. Do we pay directly to the, the, the property owner or to the In person? some instances, yes. So that's what I mean. So, All right, so just check to make sure they're still in they're business. They're still, well, absolutely. That's why I'm saying. Like, okay, you might want to check some of them. You might want to check the list again that you gave us. Make sure. So I don't know. Some business. of the businesses there are, are they they got it at the beginning and and now a couple months ago or whatever they closed they moved on but it doesn't mean that like that they didn't take care of the law the, the 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 situation where they owed money so if they owed money to pay payroll if they owed money yeah. they're a landlord they whatever the case it, it's it closes that gap um but I'll, I'll talk to Alicia and see like if if whether or not there's an opportunity for the city. And, and again, this, this next tranche, it's going to be very different because at that time, and I think former Mayor Murphy was, you know, had to respond the way that he did because it was in the middle of the pandemic. There was a lot of impact, a lot of issues. We're in a very different time at the moment. Um, and I don't know, we, we have to, you know, I don't. COVID impact, right? Like what kind of COVID impact can you prove today mm -hmm. if, if people are bouncing back? So it, it, that support might look different. I will talk to uh, Alicia and, and, and raise that concern. Hey, can we make sure that those businesses that we give money to, what, however we're eligible to do it um, in, this, in this round, that, that there's a commitment to stay open and not close. But I can say that at that time, at that round, which is gonna be different from this time, is that there was a real it was all sorts of negative impact that sure. we're trying to mitigate. But what I'm just saying, Mayor, is for businesses that go out of business, they already have protections. We have a bankruptcy system, number one. Number two is we these entities create legal entities that give them a lack of personal liability protection already. So if I close my Kevin Jordan LLC restaurant, okay, and I owe a hundred thousand dollars, and COVID took me out, and I don't have any money. I can just say, "Well, oh, didn't work out." Starting Kevin Jordan LLC the second, okay, and this hundred grand turns into a pumpkin. What public good has Josh Garcia and Kevin Jordan done by writing them a check for twenty-five thousand dollars? You haven't done any public good. You've given a windfall to a business that went bye-bye. The what who who. Who is needs help is the ongoing enterprise don't have the benefit of the bankruptcy system or just saying, I'm dissolving, have a nice day, okay, and they can just walk away from their creditors. Though and we want to protect them. So what I'm just saying is the public good is served by giving these funds out to businesses we're trying to save in town. They really do need the help because they got to patch it all together. And I'm certain that everybody came in, even the ones that closed, and showed you, oh, my God, I lost this on this. I'm guaranteed all those were legitimate. I'm just saying is if there's no follow-up criteria that says they actually stuck around, to me, it looks like it just you might as well throw it in the oven, the, the 25 grand or whatever you gave them. I do think that it's 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 debatable, and it's up for perception on which way you stand. It's the yeah. public good is that whatever the need, and with these businesses, 
you, it, it's there's circumstances that we don't know what's led them to close. If it's whether you know they 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 try you know they got the help, they were trying to bounce back, and even with the help, they couldn't make the ends meet. Like th those are the things that we just can't measure. You know what I mean? But I, I don't disqualify the 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 point that you're trying to make at all. I'm just saying that in the middle of the pandemic, there was so much need and 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 discerncertainty with these small businesses that yeah. you know it's not like we did anything wrong. Um, no, no, no. It's not. And, and, the, not well, not that we did the anything. Intent wrong. was wonderful. Not that we did anything wrong, but at the same time, like, yeah, it's 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 just up for. But I can tell you this next round is going to be, which is going to be rolled out very soon, by the way. I think you guys received communication. Okay. At 13 at the, at the senior center. Yeah. It's community-wide. It's going to be very specific and focused is the key buzzwords I've been using. Different than the first round. The first round was important. You had to help as much people as you could because there was so much need. But this round, we want longer-term uh, impact. Uh, HRIA um, has been incredible with uh, taking existing data between the community health, the, the Shana, the, the local hospital does every three years, a business survey, a community survey. We had a department head meeting where we did a little roundtable workshop. Um, we met with the advisory council members, did workshops there, and then taking that data, we did a determination of need, statement of interest, where we collected, you know, statement of interest from organizations that might apply um, to, so that we can understand what the needs are. And then they're aggregating all that data, which you'll hear about at that, at that meeting, community-wide meeting. And then also taking that input um, from community-wide um, input at that meeting so that um, it helps us understand what the communities might understand to be the priority, what the data is telling what the priorities are um, so that as we roll this out, it's going to be competitive, and we're going to highlight key, you know, key values of 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 what we're going to be looking for um, to support in this next this next tranche. Uh, so it's going to be very specific, based on community input and and data, um, but also making sure that we're achieving a longer term, greater impact. Um, that's going to help our community grow. So that's like the underlying theme. So super. We'll Good. see. We'll see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you for the input, Tanya. Thank you for the work. Uh, please let Alicia know we thank her answering Councilor Bubbles' uh, important uh, request for information. And um, you'll see her before me. Alicia, we know is impeccable. As you stated, her documentation for what she does is incredible and we enjoy working with her but please pass on one little bit of information to her on the cover letter addressed to the city council copy to mayor garcia and copy to the city messenger we haven't had a city messenger for 10 years <laughs> sorry alicia yes you motion it's been complied with. Been complied with all those in favor aye. any opposed so move motion please. to adjourn motion to adjourn all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We stand adjourned.